Welcome to the 31st episode of the Friday Nightmares podcast. For this podcast, we will be discussing haunted houses. Do you live in one? I guess we'll soon find out. My name is Heather Powell, and I'm coming to you today from Waterdown, Ontario, Canada. And joining me in his own province slash made up state is <laughs> Mr. Smoke Show Crawford coming to you from a Sports Creek, Ontario, Michigan, water down Canada. <laughs> <laughs> I love how you totally like ran with this. And now we have this completely made up state that doesn't exist with a province that you just so badly clearly want to immigrate to Canada and you've completely fabricated it it's actually quite funny um here we are Easter weekend it's just Scott and I today thank you so much to Dave C for joining us before actually Scott and I have been hosting a lot of guests as of late because we had guests on our controllers up cards down the all-star gaming podcast earlier this week and that will be released soon yes it will I was um, saying obviously we had, uh, by the time this episode's released that, that episode will be released i sure hope so <laughs> <laughs> but well, um now we had an awkward pause i never never had that because scott fucking drinks his water all the time fuck's sake scott i'm a thirsty boy we just started the podcast <laughs> well the stupid weather changing has been like uh, really screwing up my sinuses and everything. I'm all I'm all stuffed up today, so I'm like oh, trying to like clear my throat. Oh, did you or something? I did. Oh, okay. Well, hopefully they kick in and you stop drinking water every fucking five seconds. That would be great. <laughs> Scott will decide happen. whether he leaves this in or not. I always say that, and then I listen and I hear myself say, "Scott will decide whether he's going to leave this in or not after you've left it in." <laughs> I don't yep. think you take out anything, actually. <laughs> no, I, I think I take out some stuff, but yeah, like when it's things like that, I'm like, yeah, I'll leave that in because that's you're, funny. That's <laughs> just too funny. I need to leave it in. So Easter weekend, I am having two dinners, uh, one tonight, one tomorrow at the normal time of 5 p.m. Scott is having a dinner tomorrow at one o'clock in the afternoon or sorry, two o'clock. In yeah, the two afternoon. o'clock. Two o'clock in the afternoon, which I I don't quite understand. It's funny because I did I do another podcast, The Slumber Party Massacre, and I was talking with Lacey, and she's like, "Yeah, we have Easter on two p.m. on Sunday as well. Why are you guys all eating at two o'clock in the afternoon? Isn't I, that more like a a dinner, like a lunch and dinner, than yeah, it is a dinner?" It kind of is, but I actually uh, brought that up to my mom because uh, I just thought it was hilarious how like you're just shocked by this. Yeah. And uh, she was like, well, think about it. She's like, you know, we eat early and that way uh, it gives us time to clean up and whatnot. And we're not getting home at like 10 o'clock at night. How long does it take for you to clean up? I don't understand. How long does it take for you to eat? Do you think we spend four hours eating in, in the province of Ontario and we eat between five and nine? Yeah, pr- pretty much. <laughs> For <fuck's sakes. laughs> anyway um my birthday is coming up and scotty too hottie was kind enough to send me this awesome terrifier t-shirt scott you're gonna have to tell me can people see it yep um and that was really sweet and he's also sent me something else and we're gonna do an unboxing on the show because we're actually gonna release this video which is the first time scott and i have ever done that for friday nightmares we do it for controllers up cards down yeah but we've never done it for friday nightmares and of course i suggested it to him because we had a listener phil who was like oh you know i usually listen to you guys on youtube and i thought well wouldn't it be nice if we released the video that way you can see our sexy faces (laughs) or see your sexy face that's probably (laughs) more of what uh what he's really looking to see so yeah, so that's why we decided to do YouTube. So you'll get to see all of Scott's pussies that come yep. up to the screen. Like we <laughs> currently have one right now. But of course I choose the day that I partied two nights in a row because I had Good Friday off. Um, so I drank Thursday night and Friday night. So now I feel slightly hungover <laughs> and I decided to throw on some makeup and dry my hair and just hope for the best well so you look we'll beautiful see, this, uh, see scott that's really kind of you to say hey what t-shirt are you wearing is that freddy versus jason it sure is well once i get the cat out hold of on way. yeah show us your titties yeah that's what i'm talking about patreon here we come oh wow <laughs> oh thanks luna <laughs> wow, luna's like you don't need to degrade my scott his body isn't for you to see it's for my <laughs> eyes only so scott sent me something through amazon so it comes with a surprise keep your gift a surprise unwrap your present before opening this envelope oh well oh well i did broke it well you broke the rules 
I won't read it out loud because it's sappy and annoying. But it says something like, Heather, you're right. Gremlins really sucks as a film. <laughs> it's really nice that Ken supports me in liking Gremlins so much. I wish I had better taste like you. I aim to be like you. Maybe one day. Love, Scotty. You know what, Scott? It's important to have dreams. And I'm really glad that you that you have these kind of positive beliefs that one day you can be as cool as me. So I Amazon, hope to. you even had a gift wrapped with this like an extra bonus because I usually do that for people's gifts too. Even though it's three ninety nine, I really do feel like it's like worth the money. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. I'll say whenever there's the option for gift wrapping, I will do it. Right. So anyway, I'm just unwrapping this now. Oh, right. sockies! But what sockies are they? Something unique that's not Jason or Freddy. Oh man, that's impressive. Or it, or the Pennywise clown. Yeah. It. And it is. Oh, is it Pin? Oh, Hellraiser. Yes. Look at this, everybody. It is Pinhead. Very nice. Because, you know, I'm starting to wear out my socks. So I needed new ones. So I actually oh, really appreciate that gift. Thank you. You're welcome. And yeah, you got, like I said, you got one more coming to you because, you know, you're one of my best friends. So I got to treat you right. <laughs> Even though I just read, like, not what he wrote in the note. Up. <laughs> <laughs> Made him sound like a complete utter nerd. I am a total nerd. So it's all right. hard to do if you listen to our games, our controllers down or controllers up. Wait, what is it? Yeah, <laughs> controllers, controllers up, up cards, cards down. down. Oh, my God. This is going to be a rough podcast today, ladies and gentlemen, so hold on tight. Yeah, you're going to go see Kong versus uh, or Godzilla, Godzilla, versus, or Godzilla Kong, yeah. versus Kong. It's the other way around, isn't it? I'm super yep. jelly. Uh, when are you planning on going? Well, it sounds like my cousin actually wants to go with me, the one that I play magic with. So he works today, so I'm hoping to get it in tomorrow after we get done with our family stuff. So that's why you have dinner at two. So you yeah. can go see Godzilla versus Kong. Yeah, I'm right. so pumped for that movie. I am totally going to rent it here because theaters are not open here in the province of Ontario. We have gone into another 28 day lockdown. Um, retail stores are open uh, to reduce capacity. Restaurants are open for takeout and delivery only. And of course, cinemas are going to be closed. And for in some cases, they weren't even open. But we're hopeful that with the vaccines rolling out at the same time, uh, we can get the variants under control because I don't know if that's what you're finding in your area, Scott, but the variants yeah. are killing the young now. Shock, faint, young people getting together and socializing. Gosh, I'm so surprised right. that a bunch of 20-year-olds would get together and party. Uh, but we, so anyway, they've shut down Ontario in hopes to kind of get that under control as we vaccinate. So hopefully this will be the last lockdown and it's a third lockdown. Um, but you know what? It has to happen. It is what it is. Trying to have a positive attitude about it as much as I can. I don't want people getting sick and dying. So, you know? Right. <laughs> I kind of would like that dealt with. And our numbers are, we lock things down here in Way preventive. Sooner. And I think that's what people sometimes don't understand. Like P Michigan and Kent and Ontario has the same population. And ha what's your numbers at? 5,000 or something like that? Uh, we are, yeah, we're close to 6,000 a day. Apparently we're in the uh, top six highest uh, amount of daily cases now in the States. Like just because uh, apparently we have three of the different variants now showing up in our state. Yeah, we have three of the variants. The UK, the, I think there's a Brazil. Yep, the Brazilian one showed up. Um, and I think if I read correctly, we're the only state so far that has the Brazilian one that's been caught anyways. Wow. Well, because you're air travel and stuff, people are allowed to leave the country and come back and you don't have to quarantine, right? Yeah. And our governor, like, you know, she's done an amazing job, but like mm -hmm. now she is saying like, I'm not going to do this shutdown again. Like it's because the economy in Michigan's already fucked as it is before yeah. this happened. So I'm thinking she's starting to worry that if we continue this, we're just going to not have an economy at all. Yeah, and, it's yeah, that makes sense. And, and so she can't do anything about the variants, right? Those are coming internationally. Yeah. So if you're not flagging international travelers, then it's not going to make any difference. Yeah, and she's just hoping that with uh, with the vaccine rollouts, because now every like civilian that's 16 or older can now get the vaccines. So nice. the vaccines are rolling out really quickly. I'm I'm signed up to get my vaccine, but I have I have not got a confirmation yet when my uh, appointment will be, but I am signed up for it, so hopefully I'll be getting it soon. Um, and the, I think she's just hoping for the vaccines and the mask mandate to kind of quelch everything and get everything back to normal here by the summer. 
Yeah, I think that's everyone's goal. I know I read something that said that if we do this lockdown in Ontario now, continue with the rollouts of vaccines, by May, things will be better. We'll be back eating at restaurants. By June, things will be even more, you know, I guess you could say back to a normalized um, going, like cinemas would probably be open, et cetera. And then by July, maybe we could go back to having small events out in places and, and all that kind of jazz. I know my work has planned, I work at a university and they plan to have a fall semester. All universities in Canada have, I think that's a pretty like hefty promise. So we'll see if that actually happens. Right. Um, but you know what? One day at a time, right? Like it's been a year in now and I feel like at least I've adjusted. I've adjusted to things being open and closed. I just go with the wave and go with, and it's, and it's taught me some resiliency you know, as hard as this has been for a lot of people that have lost loved ones or their businesses or income, it has taught me resiliency. And I'm trying to focus on that and, and how I've grown this year, because it's been coming up to two years. I was just thinking in the shower earlier that I've been podcasting. I, yeah. I've been on my first episode talking about Terrifier. You did. Um, two years ago on Kill the Cast and also a shout out to Kill the Cast. They just released um, an interview with I can't remember the guy that oh, played David, <laughs> David Howard Thornton. <laughs> See, this is what happens when you drink too much. David <laughs> Howard Thornton. And that's probably going to be an awesome interview. I know Jerry's yeah. a really good interviewer. And I can just imagine how much fun that was, especially with Terrifier 2 coming out this year. I'm sure there was a lot to talk about. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm looking forward to listening to it. Because, yeah, like you said, like, Jerry's great at interviewing. And, like, I said, we know Jay's the one that kind of set it all up. So I know he was super excited to have this uh, episode drop. Yeah, so, absolutely. Like, I, I'm very excited to give it a listen, like hear the information that goes out there. And I guess it sounds like it's they do a lot of joking around too, which is gonna be fun. Oh yeah. You mean Jerry joking around? God, no, that's crazy. Never. I didn't I didn't know he was into that. <laughs> not at all. Um, not at all. And Scott and I will also have some Patreon things that are gonna be coming up as well. So yes. lots of exciting things coming on the month of April. Things are getting warmer. I know Days of the Dead is going on in Chicago. So for those of you who are going, I look forward to seeing your pictures and events and I don't know, tags, whatever it is that you do there. I, I look forward to seeing, I don't know, just proof of it. Proof that people went somewhere where there was something going on. I think that's kind of exciting. Yeah, I'll say like, and it's nice to hear that conventions are starting to happen again. Well, whether the safest thing or not, Scott and I aren't here to judge. <laughs> nope. Yeah, I was going to say, because I know uh, Motor City Nightmares usually goes on in April here, but uh, right now they are scheduled for a July 30th. Mm -hmm. uh, convention so there's a good chance that one may go on I mean there's... I think that's realistic to be honest with you I think that's smart and then maybe they won't have to worry about as many mandates if people just go out and get vaccinated right right and mm -hmm. yeah and it sounds like from what like kind of going on the vaccination thing it sounds like uh we're already at uh I think it was 300,000 vaccinations in the state what's that percentage of your population like we're at like what 13 million in our well no 14. we're at 9 million it, yeah yeah 14 million in our state so yeah it's about i would guess probably like just like a three or four percent like it's small numbers still but that's still a good sign that's a good chunk of people getting the vaccine at least for sure the only thing is you need at least a 70 percent to 75 percent uptake for it to be effective yeah um you know we'll hopefully so get there you know, a side talk, I was listening to baseball news because baseball started, I follow baseball, I follow a lot of different sports. And the MLB has created an incentive for teams that if they get 85% vaccinated, I think it's 80 to 85% vaccinated, then they can have more privileges in sense of seeing family traveling outside of like when you're traveling out outside your bubble, like when you go to cities and stuff like that, you can go out to restaurants and go out to other different things, which it makes sense and and the mlb of course was talking about the blue jays because this is canadian radio and right <laughs> that's what we're going to talk about and a majority of the team members want to get vaccinated because they see it as a community thing they want to have the freedom to be able to go out and do things they want to be able to um be able to you know go to restaurants see their family members not have to worry about being in that bubble that a lot of major league players have had to do i don't i know you don't follow sports overly closely scott yeah. but a lot of this has happened with the nh NHL and um, the NBA and and it's and it's stressful for players you know because one sickness spreads to that whole team and for a lot of these guys if they get sick and COVID really takes them out that could ruin their career like yeah. if they don't recover then that's it and that's their bread and butter is is playing whatever professional sport they're playing so it will be really interesting to see how all this kind of flows out as we get closer but there's definitely hope in the darkness I guess you could say yeah, there definitely is. Like, I think we're starting to see the light at the end of the tunnel. 
it just may take us a little while to get there to the full, where we're all fully vaccinated. But, you know, one day at a time, like you said, and just like, uh, yeah, because I know your rollouts for your vaccines is a, like in Canada, like at least in Ontario, is uh, a bit different than ours because you're yeah. Desert- We've done by age, right? So you were trying to vaccinate all the mature folks first. I don't necessarily agree with that. I think we should have been probably vaccinating frontline, especially younger workers <laughs> who are going to go out and socialize with their friends. But that's fine. You know, it is what it is. And we're just kind of moving through the through the motion. So yeah, because I know like with us, it was like frontline workers, like the frontline medical workers, then uh, I think think after that it was the elderly and then people that had, were more susceptible to the disease and like more more at risk which so, is technically you right because of you have high blood pressure right so yeah i guess i'm yeah i guess like i am considered a high risk because of that which you know that's makes sense and that's why because I, I think it was two weeks ago was when the people that were at high risk could sign up so i that's when i signed up but yeah i still haven't heard anything yet so i may re-sign up somewhere else just so i can at least get the vaccine soon yeah absolutely i it's funny i would have thought i would have been at high risk because i have celiac disease but apparently that's not a high risk issue um, yeah, i'm kind of surprised by that yeah so that's good i'm happy about that yeah um i'll go when it's my turn i'm in not a like i'm in a rush like i would like for it to happen but at the same time like i think other people should go before me because right. I'm a socialist and I believe in fairness for everyone. Wait That's a minute, right. you socialist. For all the Americans, horrible. I'm a socialist. Yes. And that's when we lost all viewership for our podcast. <laughs> so no, I guess, that's when we gained more viewership. Oh, I'm sure. Yes. Well, if, if people listening to us this long haven't p- figured out that we're both pretty liberal, I think. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I haven't listened to our opinions at all, right? Which... Um, which is fine, you know, think what you want to think, but definitely Scott and I are not shy about sharing how our views and opinions on, on different factors that affect (laughs) our lives and other people's. So further ado, we should probably get on with these 2021 movies before I fall asleep. Um, (laughs) because because heather likes to go hard um yeah you do i sure do um and you know what that's okay you know live what is it live hard live fast or something like that save it for live live hard die young save it for a good looking corpse or something like that (laughs) i like that (laughs) um yeah i don't i prefer not to die though no i I dream i died this week and i told him i would come back as a zombie and haunt him yeah i'll say that that was not a good dream i would do the most fucked up haunting to you like you'd be on a date and shit and i would be like whisper things into their ear like scott pees his pants what the hell (laughs) scott wishes you were gizmo (laughs) well i mean i would like take all your your fucking figurines and switch them around or like put them in sexual positions with each other (laughs) like the worst ghost that would haunt you do you think as a canadian ghost traveling over to the american side i would need to get a ghost passport and like there's a ghost border yeah, you might need to, and then you have to worry because there's no ghost health care. Like, what I have to worry about, like, you know, declaring ghost demons, like, how many demons are you bringing over with you? Um, you know, how many poltergeists, and they, like, yeah. check my how, ghost car to see how much I have. How many hauntings do you plan on doing while you're here? Yeah, how many hauntings? <laughs> oh, it'd just be you. It would yeah. just be you. I would fucking Aww. haunt the shit out of you. I Oh, no. I feel I would, so like, loved. I would do mean shit, though. I would do shit that you'd be like, this isn't funny anymore, and I would be fucking dying, <laughs> especially if you were on dates. Oh my God. I would just, it would be the best. I can't think of anything (sighs) more fun than terrorizing you. I see the love. I I feel the love. You know, it's true. If I didn't even care, I wouldn't bother terrorizing you. I just get by your house. But if I, if I like you, I want to torture you. Exactly. That's why I feel so loved. Like if I was in the movie Jigsaw or Saw, Jigsaw, I, that would mean that I liked all the people I kidnapped and did all that shit. (laughs) Right. (laughs) I'd be like, take this as a compliment that I'm making you slice off your leg. Why are you so upset? This means I like you. (laughs) This is means we're friends. Um, So yeah. So we'll break into our 2021 movies. Uh, The first one we're going to talk about is The Toll. And I'm going to talk about this one because it was filmed in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. So I live in Waterdown, Ontario, which is a sub-community of Hamilton, Ontario. 
And I was watching this film and it starts off with an Uber driver picking up someone from the airport and it picked them up from the Hamilton airport. And I like lost my mind. Brandon Orlick made fun of me because I thought it was so cool. And by the <laughs> way, Scott just took another drink of water. That is like 18 drinks of water he's taken since we started recording. I don't understand. Scott, are you dehydrated today? Well, it's helping me from constantly trying to clear my throat while we're on air. Why do you need to clear your throat? Because of the sinus drainage, all that crap <sighs> from the weather. You're so weak. Oh, oh, God. oh, I can't wait. Why do you got to gotta point you. this shit out? I can't wait to fucking haunt you one day. I am <laughs> going to fucking like, I don't know. I need to think of something more creative, though, than, than switching around your figures and your, yeah, maybe I'll like make your pinhead. Oh, you'll be sleeping on the couch and then I'll like move the pinhead over. So it's like right on top of you. That's oh, so you mean, you mean do the trick that I always did to poor Tim? Yes. Yes, and <laughs> Tim will have redemption. Anyway, back to the toll. So the toll <laughs> was filmed in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. It's, it's basically about an Uber driver that picks up a uh, passenger and it's a woman. And they have this real awkward social conversation for the first half an hour. And they get stuck in the middle of nowhere and a bunch of supernatural shit happens to them. It's an 80-minute runtime. Um, it's avail available on Apple iTunes, Google Play, Microsoft Store, and YouTube, and it's getting around. Uh, I started following Max Toplin, who is the main character in it. He's Canadian, so of course I have to follow my Canadian of brothers and sisters on Instagram. Uh, what did you think about this movie, Scotty? I have not seen it yet. What the fuck, Scotty? Hey, I've been busy uh, doing our podcast prep and then uh, our Patreon prep, so I didn't get a chance to get around to this one. Yet. Plus, you told me, watch this at home because it is very, very it is. dark, so it, it, wouldn't, it would not play well on my phone. So I'm, I'm would, waiting until yeah. I have a chance. You'll have a hard time with this if you watch it on your phone, for sure. This movie is excellent, though. Um, it's currently in my personal top 10. I don't know if it will stay there. The year is still young. So when I say personal top 10, like understand that this is april and we still got eight more months of movies to go. right <laughs> um but i definitely seriously enjoyed it so much so that i responded to max's instagram story when he was promoing it and i said that you know we'll be talking about it on our podcast on friday nightmares and he liked that that's so, awesome isn't that nice so please check this out i already told you where it's available for rent it's a very good supernatural movie it's it's not a lot of cast but and it's you know not super high budget but yet again this is an example of a movie that uses its budget well and that an 80 minute runtime you're not going to be disappointed with the length so i'll let scotty talk about our next one all right so yeah the next movie we'll talk about is uh another 2021 film called phobias uh, which is basically about a group of people. It plays out like an anthology, and it's uh, basically a group of people that end up going to this facility where the this crazy doctor is kind of weaponizing their fears. Mm -hmm. So he ends up like uh, putting them through these experiments that makes them relive what they uh, like their their biggest fears and kind of what what happened to them. And each story tackles a different phobia which I thought was a very cool idea because, yeah, like the way I, like it is an anthology and I really liked the way that they, each story was a different phobia and like, yeah, each story was really cool. Uh, really good acting. Some uh, I'll say just the story in general, the stories in general were all pretty damn good. I really enjoyed, yeah. I think every single one of them. It's been, I think almost what, two, uh, two weeks now since I've watched it. So like, it's a little bit fuzzy in my memory, but yeah, I did really enjoy this one. Will it be in my end of the year list? Probably not, but it'll still be higher up there because it well, was still and, well, worth watching. And we do awards. So this could be yeah. something that could win anthology of the year. Yeah, exactly. Right. Depending on what other anthologies come out. For me, this would be a very high contender for anthology of the year. I very much enjoyed the, the wraparound story and how it connected to everybody's individual stories that had brought them there. There was one phobia that I really enjoyed about a break and enter, enter in the twist, break and enter and a twist in that story. Yes. I thought it was really, really well done. This kind of reminded me a lot of Immortal. It's, it's more realistic stories that happen. Like they are yeah. a little more sensationalized. Immortal was very bare bones, gritty, real, almost like you felt like you were watching people's lives unfold. Um, this does have that supernatural spin with the facility, but also has some stories that are just, you could see happening. One yeah. in particular, you could see happening. Um, I don't think it's too far-fetched. Far it's an 85-minute runtime. 
I don't think you're going to waste your time with this at all. It's available on Apple iTunes, Google Play, Microsoft Store, and YouTube. And I definitely believe it's worth a rental, $3.99, $4.99. I don't think you'll be disappointed in this. I obviously feel the same way about The Toll. I think both of these movies are solid. They're decent 2021 watches. Even if they end up not being you know, one of your top movies of the year, I don't think you're going to dis- be disappointed in your time with it. So no, check it, especially I, if you like anthologies, check it out if you dig anthologies. Yeah, and I was going to say, and this may make some people's top 10 lists. That it you never absolutely know. may. You're 100% right, Scotty. Scotty too hottie. Yes. Yeah. Scotty. Girlfriend. Girlfriend. Um, Amber. Oh, sorry. Why am I going to the next one? I'll let I, you go ahead. Well, no, that was, uh, I was the one that talked about that. Uh, I have not seen this next one. Oh, hmm. looks like the master has become the learner. Wow. <laughs> well, I mean, um, granted, I did leave a couple off that I know you want to watch that we can talk about I'm together. Really Scott, I nerfs them up because I watch 15, 20, 21 movies. So Scott doubled down this year. So Scott and Brandon all or Lick this year are competing for 2021 watches. And we're in a chat group and they like argue with each other and it's cute. But sometimes I try to stir the pot. You do stir so, the pot. <laughs> and, but unfortunately, but sometimes I mean every day. <laughs> yeah. And I was saying, unfortunately, with Brandon Orlick, I accidentally woke the sleepy beast. (laughs) And he is sleepy. That's actually a really good way to describe him. Super Mm -hmm. sleepy. So Amber Descent, uh, basically, this is about somebody that goes to a haunted house. And it's haunted. Uh, Not a paranormal (laughs) investigator, though. So it's uh, very slow. (laughs) Like, when you say slow burn... This is a slow burn. Oh boy. It is a 92 minute runtime. It feels like a 92 minute runtime. There is a trope in this that um, once Scotty watches it, he'll be like, oh, Heather must have not liked this part. <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> but you know what? It was fine. It was clearly a low budget film. And I thought that the tie-in that they did at the end was pretty good. It reminded me a lot of, I can't actually give the movie away, but there was a movie that came out last year, early last year, Scotty, that you and I talked about. It was theatrical release. And the ending of it, we both were like, what the fuck was this ending supposed to be? And if you don't know what I'm talking about, I'll tell you on our break. Okay, I Um, think I might know. And this kind of was similar to that, only it did it better. Um, Okay. So I think if you like slow burns, uh, perhaps if you liked movies like, I don't know, The Lodge in the sense of the mystery that's happening, you're not quite sure who is who is what is what, you might enjoy this. It's available on Google, Vudu, uh, Fango area now, YouTube, and Microsoft Store. It's given a 3.0 rating on Letterboxd, but I don't see many people that have watched it besides me. Um, in our circle so I don't know you know we do follow a lot of people now on Letterbox, and I think I'm the only one right now that's seen it um I would say Look a 199 I know right I would say a 199 to 299 rental is fair maybe 399 if you like slow burns and you really like movies like The Lodge or The Babadook only this isn't as good as the Babadook, so please don't walk in thinking it's going to be the Babadook. But similar kind of theme. If you like those kind of movies, then you may enjoy this. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'll probably give this one a watch at some time, like some point, just because, you know, I got to pat out those numbers. If I'm yeah, gonna by the end of the like... year, I would say if you're, if you're bored one day, you could watch this at work. Okay. Like there's not, it's not, there's no scenes that are super dark. It's, it's pretty well lit. It's just, it's just not the most exciting movie. And it does right. feel 92 minutes. Okay, good to know. Yeah, I'll probably watch it at some point and like maybe get my thoughts on it. Um, But yeah, I'll jump on to the next one, uh, which I was looking at. It does not seem like this is available to rent just yet, Um, but hopefully I believe here in the next week or so it should be. So maybe by the time our episode releases... Uh, but this it's available movie... in Canada. It's available on Cineplex. Oh, is it? Rent. Yeah. I think that it just had Letterbox hasn't updated it yet, but I do believe that it's available on, on um, Google Play, Apple iTunes, okay. Okay, and I just Cineplex checked, uh... in Canada. Okay, because I just checked the, uh, Amazon just to make sure, and there's okay. nothing there. Okay. But um, so yeah, it might be just like iTunes and Google Play right now. Yeah. Uh, but this movie is called Honeydew. And I've heard uh, slight rumblings of people looking forward to seeing this one, and so I wanted to check it out. And yeah, I would say uh, this one is uh, very uh, interesting, but also wears its influences on its sleeves. Mm. Um, But it's basically about this couple that uh, 
are driving down this country road and they decide to camp out and get told like hey you can't stay here so they find like they need to find some place to go because their car breaks down and they get welcomed into this elderly lady's house and then she just starts acting very strangely Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um and yeah like i won't say what this uh influences are because it'll kind of give it a little spoiler but it's a very uh weird movie like not in a bad way this is like a good weird because it's just like what the hell is going on you're trying to figure it out the whole entire time and it's got some very unsettling scenes and like the score itself like has some very unsettling music to it and there was also some very oddly placed Christmas music played throughout this in certain points and you're going what the hell is going on (laughs) but yeah I really enjoyed this one this was uh, a lot of fun I thought everyone in it did a really good job acting wise um, and it just was just very bizarre, but like just very fun watch and very easy watch. I got to tell you, I love when you say the word bizarre. You know why? Because he makes you think of that song. How bizarre, how bizarre. Ooh, baby, ooh, you're baby, driving me crazy. You're making me crazy every time I look around. And it takes me back to my young Heather days of roller skating at this local roller rink I <laughs> nice. used to go to. Every time you say it, I'm like, hmm. Like it really does. <laughs> uh, not this but, movie did not take me back to happy days. So, um, <laughs> really, are you sure? <laughs> you know, I I enjoyed this film for what it was. I think it's extremely well acted, extremely well written, um, very creepy. It's a hundred and six running time. It deserves a running time that it has. It wasn't high on my list, but that is a personal thing. Yeah. I think this movie is well made. I thought the ending was very dark and depressing, which it's supposed to be. I never got the purpose for what they were doing, though. I didn't understand why. And maybe yeah. you can explain that to me later, because that was the only thing that really hit it, really, really held it back for me, is that I do like to know why people are doing things that they're doing. And when I feel like there's absolutely no closure, for a movie like this, it kind of turned me off a bit. Some people may like that, though, and it may not matter to them. So I would recommend it. As I said, it's on Cineplex in Canada if you want to rent it from there. I believe it's a higher cost one because this was supposed to be a theatrical release. Yeah, because I believe so, this was a Lionsgate produced It movie. is. It's a well-made movie. So you are going to be spending, you know, 20 bucks on this. Do I think it's worth it? Yeah, I think it's a $20 solid film. If you like yeah. slow burns and you like well-acted films and you like dark shit you'll probably enjoy this quite a bit if that doesn't sound like your thing i would not spend 20 dollars on it because you're not gonna like it right but yeah i definitely think it's uh yeah it's worth that rental because it's a fun watch and um uh, like even if it doesn't make your end of the year list or whatever like it's still i think worth checking out because it's just a it's just kind of a nostalgia trip in a way and also just a really weird movie but it's like it's good horror. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, would you, I personally, I think if you don't like slow burns, wait for it to drop to like, so, you know, we're pretending like if this was normal time, the theaters were open, we may say to you, if you really like this type of movie, go to the movie theater to watch it. Yeah. Since theaters aren't open and, you know, prices are, are different right now, then I would say to you, wait a couple of months till it would technically come to VOD and then rent it for the $4.99, $3.99 if you don't feel like dropping $20 on this. Um, right. That would be or, my only cabinet. Yep, or go to the matinee if you have a matinee. It's uh, cheaper prices. Yeah, I think that would be fair too. But if you're going on a date, Scotty, and you're classy and you're paying for your date's matinee and snacks, it's going to add up, Scotty. I'm making my own date pay for stuff. You kidding me? Yeah, right. Scott Smoke show like, ain't taking care of that stuff. He's such a liar, everyone. <laughs> Just so we're clear, Scott's like actually thinks he was born in the 1800s as an 1800 gentleman. He'd be like, my lady, which flavor of the popcorn would you prefer to smooth your lips as I hope to touch them later? <laughs> <laughs> it has been a fortnight since I have laid my eyes upon you. Oh. God, it makes me want to vomit every time you do that. <laughs> but you know what? You're going to make some lady very, very happy, Scotty, with your smoothness. Smooth. Um, so the next movie is The Resort, which just made me miss traveling. It's <laughs> a 75-minute run time. Um, it's very low budget. Four friends head to Hawaii to investigate reports of a haunting at an abandoned resort in hopes of finding the infamous half-faced girl 
So the resort is abandoned and they want to go there for this chick's birthday. So when you first start watching it, you're like, oh, there wasn't a lot of money put into this. And then they fly in a motherfucking helicopter to an island, which I assume is Hawaii or some other island. I don't know what island it was. And I'm like, so this is where all the money went, paying for the fucking helicopter. Right. (laughs) Right? (laughs) Because the filming was actually pretty good in the helicopter to get there. And the filming was actually pretty good um well it it doesn't do it like a found footage it does it like you're watching these people go through this adventure so it's filmed pretty well for a movie that didn't obviously have a lot of money not a lot happens like you're kind of just watching them go on this like ghost hunt for a big part of the movie and then creepy stuff happens in the last 25 minutes the ending is fucking weird (laughs) i didn't even get the ending it was fucking weird but it was it was fine you know what if you can find this for a dollar 99 rental and you feel like turning off your brain and just chilling and watching something it's fine but i would never say to people oh man you better watch this before the end of the year because if you don't you're going to be super disappointed but i had a good enough time with it it was fun it was fluffy you know for a 75 minute runtime and in the mood i was in at that moment it was a nice little we're going on a ghost adventure and shit's gonna happen film. nice like for the means that you and i watched it we have a screener well, you I would watched say, it well, well that we could watch it yeah. um we have a screener so honestly the screener isn't gonna hurt you to watch it you're not gonna you know obviously bail any money for it it will eventually be available on google play youtube all that kind of jazz i think a 199 to 399 rental it's fine you know it, it just know going into it that it is definitely a lower budget film not a lot happens but you are going to get to see some beautiful landscapes of this island wherever they're going it's a, it's a pretty nice place and the scares are more natural scares they're oh, okay you know I'll, I'll say that where they did use special effects they're practical um and they did a good enough job so it was it was fine not nothing over the top but nothing horrible i've seen worse i've seen way worse yeah so, <laughs> I'm sure we both have right you know and i think when you've watched and i'm not trying to be boastful here but when you watch the amount of movies that scott and i have sometimes you saw something like this and you're like yeah some people are gonna walk out and be like it's the biggest piece of shit i can assure you it is not the biggest piece of shit that exists um yeah. this movie at least had some talent and love put into it and people tried you watch some movies where you don't even think if people tried <laughs> right like that they just kind of and the script makes no sense at least this the script makes enough sense you yeah. care about the characters enough like it's enough either way yep i i'll say i'll, I'll have to check this one out at some point because the synopsis alone sounded interesting enough to me like my kind of film and yeah the way you're talking about it it's like yeah i'll probably watch this at some point just for the hell of it um but yeah, i'll jump on to the next one uh this one i think we both have seen uh and that is the banishing which is directed by christopher smith which i'm bringing him up because he did my number one favorite film of the decade which is black death Oh, yeah. So I was super excited to see this movie. Um, I believe this comes out on Shudder in, like, what, another week or two? Yeah, it, it's released on April 14th, I believe. Okay. But, yeah, this is basically a uh, a haunted house, well, a period piece haunted house. So set in the 1930s with, mm-hmm. a, uh, with a religious t- uh, overtone to it. But man, this I thought was uh it's it's a very slow burn. Yes. But damn, did I find it extremely uh creepy in a lot mm-hmm. of moments. And I mm-hmm. thought the mm-hmm. acting and the set design and the costuming for the deck that decade all just done so fucking well. This is yeah. like a high quality horror film. Absolutely. No, I couldn't agree with you more. It it wasn't for me. I found it boring. Yeah. But that's a personal thing. I would never say this movie was bad. The acting was good. The the set was good. The directing was good. The story, I just found not paced well enough for me. Yep, I remember you were telling me that. And like, and I think I told you, like, I think I replied back going, yeah, I'm not having an issue with the pacing, yeah. but I think it's because that, that story just took me right in. Yeah, you like historical period pieces. And for me, I find they have to be done really well for me. They have to move. Yeah. Like I saw The Awakening, which was recommended from Mark Nato from 2011 on Hidden Gems. That was also histor- a historical piece that took place in an orphanage in the, I think it was the late 1800s, early 1900s. And I enjoyed that a a lot more because I felt it moved quicker. Right. I found this, um, the haunting was kind of boring for me. I didn't feel like it was creepy. I didn't get 
some of the references back and forth between some personal issues. And then I felt like they threw in some shit about Nazi Germany, just to throw in some shit about Nazi Germany. Um, but that's yet again, a personal criticism that I wouldn't walk out of this movie and say, it's a piece of shit because it's not a piece of shit. It no. just didn't work for me. It's a 97 minute runtime. Um, it has a pretty high rating on letterbox only though. Scott and I are the only two ones in our circle that have watched it. Uh, it has a 2.6 rating on letterbox, which is pretty good. Um, majority of the stars are three, four or five, which I think, yeah. you know, speaks highly to the film. Yeah. And um, I was going to say, like, I see this one being on a lot of people's list by the end of the year. Yeah. I think a lot of people will dig this. It will not be on my list personally, but I would never, you know, yet again, neither was the lodge for me and neither right. was the lodge for you. We, you and I kind of saw an eye on that one, but like a lot of people love that film and who yeah. would be I to come out and shit on them and tell them not to like it. I, I yet again, I think that attitude's immature and stupid and I refuse to be part of it. So um, it just wasn't for me. And the reasoning for me was the pacing and the lack of connectivity with some of the things that happened in the story. But, you know, Scott, obviously Scott had no problem. So yeah, I, you know. I absolutely loved it. And it, I, that was kind of a spoiler because it may be on my year end list. It's high up there right now. Oh, wow. Look at that. That's a big thing to say for April. Yeah. That's a big like, thing to say for April. Because so. right now it's sitting comfortably in my top five. Yeah. I, I think the only one right now is the visual for me that I think for visual. sure. Yeah. We'll be there. Right. I think that one was just really good. Uh, really good. I just <laughs> thought it was good. And it had good character development and good plot. It was good. So <laughs> this will be available on Shutter. So, you know, give yourself a week or so. I think I said the 14th, probably Thursday, the 15th is more accurate because they only release things on Thursdays, right? That's their release yeah. date. Uh, usually, I think like once in a great while, they might release something a little earlier, but yeah, most of the time it's on Thursdays. Okay. So it's probably the 15th, 15th or 14th. Check it out. You'll enjoy it. Yeah. Um, and the next one I have not seen. So Oh boy. All right. So the next one is uh, a Shutter exclusive that came out last last week. So by the time you hear this, probably about two weeks ago. And that is Violation. This movie is a uh, rape revenge style tale. I will say uh, it is very artistic. Like this is a artsy fartsy style film because of the way with a lot of the shots and just a lot of like just kind of unnecessary showing of like certain things that just make me feel like this is like art house to the extreme mm -hmm. um though like the acting and everything in this is very solid directing really well um the issue i had with with it was more storyline i think because it was very confusing because this does i think i'm quoting brandon orlick on this but it does kind of a pulp fiction thing where it's oh, like jumping all man. over the place timeline wise and where in pulp fiction it's done so well that you know what's going on and you know everywhere everything's piecing together in this i felt really confused because something happens and i'm going wait a minute this is this like the next day is this two weeks from now is this four weeks before I, what's going on i'm so confused like it literally left me scratching my head and very confused um also i will give this a uh give a warning i guess that this is uh there is one scene in particular that is very very adult only okay because it shows like full-on erection nudity up close like i at first i thought i'm like am i watching it porn you got excited like, you got yeah, your, I was like, your hand <laughs> you got your lotion your yeah I was, pants were off i was ready <laughs> but no but I was, it's like i was just kind of shocked to see that on screen i'm going whoa all right like um but yeah i was not a big fan of this i would probably give it like a average rating like a five and a half six and a half somewhere around there like it's not a bad movie and it's well done and well acted it's just it was really too confusing the way the story was put together okay okay and this is available on shutter right uh, yes, yes, this was yeah. a Shutter exclusive, and this one I believe was not available to you on. No, Canadian it's not Shutter. available on Canadian Shutter. You can rent it on Cineplex. Okay, um, I did see it on there, but it sounds like I haven't heard anyone be like, "For sure, I love this. Check it out." So, yeah, I like both you and Brandon told me to like. I asked you, would it even get an award? Because that's really what it came down to it for me. If if we yeah. were going to even consider this for an award, I'll watch it. If it's not even going to be considered for that. I, I can only take so much out heart art house we're so deep look at us go you know i yeah i really can so it, it had to be something that was going to be worth my time and it sounded like this wasn't that good <laughs> so. no, I, 
like it was like I said, some people may really dig it, but like mm. so far, like the consensus seems to be like the same issues Brandon and I both had, which was kind of just confusion. Okay. Um, so yeah, I I don't think it'll get an award like of like from the rewards I can remember off the top of my head. Yeah. So yeah, I'm I'm not really recommending it. Okay, makes sense. So the last one that we're gonna talk about today, that's a 2021 release, is Hospital. This film is a uh, from Taiwan, and it came out on the 31st in Taiwan, so December 31st, 2020, in Taiwan, and then it was released on Netflix US March 22nd, 2021. So it was technically an end-of-the-year 2020 release for those who lived in Taiwan, and then for us on the other side of the pond, I guess you could say, uh, we got it in 2021. And it's a very average ghost story. It's an about a group of people that go to an abandoned hospital that has had a lot of death and tragedy happen. And people are looking for their loved ones. Very, very Asian um, type of ghost story. And okay. I, because Scott and I did that Asian ghost story episode back in January, I feel like I have a better appreciation for stories like this. Um, it helps. It helps as you understand that kind of like that subtext of culture that kind of motivates um, individuals to look for ghosts or the reason why they feel that ghosts are angry when they die, et cetera. It was very, very well done in that sense. Do I think this is a big recommendation for other people? It has a very low rating on Letterboxd. It has a 1.8. Oh, wow. I do not think this movie is a 1.8. I don't. Um, I don't think that's fair. I think that's a lot of Amer Northwesterners not getting it, to be quite that, that That could be absolutely right? what it is. So... Um, it's an 89 minute runtime. I think I've already said that it's available on Netflix. It is obviously subtitled and like some of the reviews here is like 0 0.5 for as effort, whatever this was. Well, I don't understand. Like that's, it's a clearly a ghost story. Like right. it's clearly a group of people that are trying to reconnect. Like there, there is no way you couldn't understand the fucking plot unless you couldn't read and you couldn't watch. And I don't mean to sound so degradingly, but when I see reviews like that, I'm like, that's, that's not fucking fair. Yeah. Like you didn't, this movie wasn't completely unable to understand. I watched it while I was working out. So I was running and I had subtitles on and I was still able to follow what was going on very easily understand the reason why the people were there, understand their grief and their guilt and how everything was connected. The ending was a little like, oh, I don't really quite get that, but I guess that's where we are now. And it was very, very Asian-driven ghost stories. So if you really like Asian ghost stories, you will probably enjoy this film. I recommend you watch it, Scott. I don't think it's as shitty as people are saying it is. I don't okay. think it's like the best movie of the year. But I think if people shit on it this bad, you shouldn't watch any foreign films because it's right. it, uh, it's not that bad. It's better than The Resort. And I think it's personally better than Amber's Descent. Um, and those are two English speaking films. And I think this one was definitely well, way better made, way more money put into it. Um, yeah. So that's my yeah. thoughts on uh, on Hospital. Yeah, and I was saying, you know me, like I'm trying to dive even more into these, uh, like the foreign subtitled watches, because like last year I tackled a lot for 2020, and this year I want to continue that trend and just like watch pretty much anything, because like I also want to see when it comes to like these uh, foreign horror films, I want to see the good and the bad, because I want to see what I would consider bad. Like, you won't really consider bad. this bad. Yeah, and I was going to say, like, I don't, yeah, this one doesn't this, sound like, like it's going to be that bad. This is actually paced, one of the quickest paced Asian ghost story stories I've ever seen. And see, that right there already attracts me to it, because, you know, I had an issue with pacing with a lot of the Asian ghost stories. Like, you have a friend of yours that you'd like to watch movies with? I would recommend you and her watch this movie together. Like, okay. I think she would enjoy it. Like, it's not, and that's why I don't get these fucking reviews. I'm like, where, like, this movie wasn't that fucking bad. Like it really wasn't. It it's it's not a bad film unless you I don't know couldn't read and didn't watch the screen. And I'm not saying that to be offensive. I'm saying right. that like quite openly. Like this movie moved at a quick pace. It set it up right away. Why they were there. You get some scares right away. And there's scare, 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 scare. Like it's it's go 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 go. And typical Asian ghost story style. You don't get the music fucking leading up to it. You just right. get. And I love that. Ah! <laughs> I, and I love right. that type. And there's a really sad story that comes with it. Two really sad stories that are interconnected. And like, I don't, anyway, yeah. I, I'm going to stop. I'm going to get off my high horse here. Because, <laughs> but I just, when I see shit like that, I just, with absolutely no reasoning, 
to why they thought it was a bad film, I just lose complete respect for whatever yeah. review they were going to do because this is not. If you didn't like this film, give give proper reasons why. Yeah, I was going like, to say if you if you can't review a film objectively, then just, yeah, don't even bother. Or you don't give zero stars and go that was a point five for effort. Yeah. So, like, what the fuck does that mean? Yeah. <laughs> like, don't bother writing anything at all. Right. You know. Anyway, so that's our twenty twenty one movie. <laughs> And yet again, if you enjoy Asian ghost stories, uh, it's a good free watch on Netflix. I think it's a solid international film. You can be the judge for yourself. Um, not the best Asian ghost story in the world, but definitely not the worst. So um, yeah, check it out if you're interested. All right. Yeah, I'll definitely, I'll definitely watch it at some point because I always take your word on these things a lot more highly than most people. Well, yeah, I, I honestly don't think you're going to hate it. I well, I'll say, and you know my taste really well, too. Like, honestly, I, and I think for you and the person that I'm referring to, your friend, I think that, you know, this would be a fun movie for the two of you to sit together and watch. Like, I right. think it would just be a light, fluffy ghost story. It's 89-minute runtime. You're not going to hate your time with it. Like, and it's free on Netflix. Right. So Can't argue with that. Right? Yeah. All right. So, yeah, I guess we can uh, jump into our older films um do you want me to do mine first or do you want to do yours i'm gonna do mine first stop All trying right. to steal my lime rain i'm trying always but i just can never do it i know right so this so scott i guess had mentioned to me that at some point he told me he watched tales from the hood 1995 and i said oh i guess he wanted a fluffy film oh I was I watching part three part three and I just assumed that Tales from the Hood was going to be silly and goofy. So I had avoided watching it because I thought, I'll wait till I'm in a silly and goofy mood <laughs> to watch it. Um, Tales from the Hood 1995 is not a goofy film. No, <laughs> it's not a not silly film. It is very much a social commentary that I was not prepared for. So... Um, Excellent film. All the stories in it, particularly the first one, really resonate today. Yeah. Uh, same with the third that goes into the wraparound. And the wraparound is just awesome. Yeah, the wraparound is fantastic in this movie. I can't think of a more solid... Okay, well, there's a couple other ones. But this is one of the most solid anthologies I've ever watched. Mm -hmm. I'll say, like, see... Now this just goes to prove, like, I'm not always trying to fluff up my numbers here, Missy. Yeah, I guess you're not, Scott. Um, <laughs> this film is just incredible. I, I don't want to spoil it for people that haven't seen it. But if you like anthologies and for some reason you're like me and you just haven't got around to watching this movie for whatever reason it may be, I strongly encourage you to watch it it has a 3.5 rating on letterbox it definitely deserves that plus some um it is it is just it is just incredible you can find it on amazon google voodoo amazon prime and microsoft store it is worth whatever rental you pay it's upsetting that issues that were happening in 1995 were being talked about and we're still shocked 25 years later yeah it it really is um upsetting yeah to, for me anyway it was um you know I, that to me was very powerful yeah and like kind of gonna go on a lighter tone here but would you say this movie is the shit it is definitely the shit <laughs> um but i and i appreciate the lighterness but this movie shouldn't be taken lightly no no absolutely um not. and this was a really good political social movie that was straight to the point and probably not what people wanted to hear then and probably what people don't want to hear now yeah. um and but man is it good <laughs> fuck it's good yeah and i was gonna say uh when i first watched this was when it first came out on vhs wow so i was you know what is 95 so i was a young boy i did not get any of the social commentary i still enjoyed the movie but it went way over my head because i was yeah. way too young you were just like oh a couple of bad cops <laughs> yeah like i didn't think right. anything of it yeah and then yeah rewatching it because it took me like i'd say a good 10 or so years later till i rewatched again and i'm going oh oh shit yeah. yeah and this shit still happens yeah it's it was very yeah it was it was very hard to watch and i'm going to switch 
from the movie I had on here because I put that on there a while ago, but I'm going to switch to a different movie. So Scott doesn't actually know what I'm going to say. And it's going to oh, be boy. Tales from the Crypt. Oh, nice. Um, 1972. And it is a 92 minute runtime. And I got to say, I had avoided watching this because it was from 1972 and I didn't think I was going to dig it. And I fucking loved it. It was another anthology that just blew me out of the water. All the stories I thought were good. The wraparound I thought was awesome. Um, if you haven't seen Tales from the Crypt 1990 or and from 1972, get on that. Get on yes. that in Tales from the Hood. It is strongly worth your time. This is available on Amazon Prime, Popcorn Flick, 2B TV, the Roku channel, and direct television. And yeah, like you want to see some awesome stories and one that was just so powerful for me i just thought it made so much sense it had to do with wishing and i just oh, i yeah. thought the ending of it was just so clever like it was just so clever and made so much sense and i just loved it so please if you haven't had a chance to watch tales from the crypt 1972 check it out yeah, I watched this. This was my uh, my five hundredth film from last year. That was a first time watched, so I saved it for then because I wanted something more well known that I had been, that I had missed out on. Mm. And yeah, this is a solid fucking anthology. Like, uh, and I'm starting to realize because we've both been kind of just jumping into a lot of anthologies lately, and I'm noticing like a lot of the ones from the '70s are really fucking good. They are, and for some reason, I always thought they were going to be shitty, and nothing was further from the truth. Yeah, I never thought that, I thought some would be shitty, but I thought most of them would just be, eh, mediocre. But man, I was wrong. And yeah, I'm glad to be wrong. I hear you. Uh, so yeah, I guess I will just jump on to the two that I uh, brought to the table. And of course, since it's Haunted Houses, I went with a theme. Um, the first one I am going to talk about is called Ghost House, or also known as La Casa 3. So apparently there's a La Casa 1 and 2 out there. Nice. But this is from 1988, and it's uh, directed by Umberto Lenzi. So this is totally crazy Italian horror, and I am all for it. This movie was nuts. It was violent. It was gory. It was confusing. It was silly. Uh, I really, can't, I don't really want to get too much into it because it's just one of those where you just have to watch it and see. Because holy crap, like some really bizarre. Oh, there we go, using the word bizarre again. How bizarre? How bizarre? <laughs> Baby, but yeah, there's some baby. Okay. Really weird things that happen in this house, and uh, one of the a really cool effect that doesn't make sense, but I love it, is uh, this ghost that's haunting this place likes to like blow out the light bulbs and all that stuff. Ooh. Like, but when it does, the effect of the light bulb, you see it, and it's like uh, bubbling and getting bigger and bigger and bigger before it explodes and i'm going that wouldn't happen it would just explode because it's glass it wouldn't like expand and get bigger like a balloon <laughs> but it, like that's what it was doing it was getting bigger like a balloon before it would explode it was, that's pretty cool actually that it was a like cool a effect yeah, yeah it was really cool effect didn't make any sense but at the same time i'm like that's just awesome and uh yeah, this movie is just so much fun, so strange, and so Italian. But so oh, Italian, so Italian. But uh, yeah, I highly recommend it. It's a, I guess I would call this a hidden gem, hidden gem from the '80s because I had never heard of this one. So this was just something I just stumbled across and was like, oh, I gotta see this. And yeah, totally worth your time. Nice. Um, the next one that I watched is uh, from 2009, and that is The Uninvited, which I come to find out later is a remake of the Korean film uh, Tale of Two Sisters. And how was it? This movie was really freaking cool. Nice. Like, I thought it was going to go somewhere, that, uh, and it actually didn't. And then ended up the twist at the end really surprised me. But this was a really, really well done haunted house themed style horror film. Very good acting. Um, but yeah, like I, I couldn't recommend this one enough. This was just very solid horror at its best. That's and awesome. Yeah. Now, now it makes me want to go back and watch Tales of Two Sisters because I still have not seen that. I wish I would have known this was a remake so I could have watched the original first. But oh, well, that happens. Uh, so yeah, I'll definitely have to go back and watch that one and give my thoughts on that sometime on the show. But yeah, I definitely recommend The Uninvited. It's a very good movie. 
but make sure it's the 2009 one because I believe there is also the Uninvited from 1945, which I'll probably watch that at some point as well, just because why not? Which would not be the Korean remake, because I'm it's, pretty sure. No. <laughs> Those that years don't line up with each other. I'm just not at all. <laughs> that's just my guess. Uh, so that's going to conclude our older watches. Uh, and we're going to break into what we've been listening to. So we wanted to give a shout out. Scott and I fought over who was going to bring up yes. this podcast. Um, because Scott always steals my thunder. Always. I always steal your thunder. Excuse me, Missy. <laughs> no, you, no, it's true. I do. <laughs> no, you don't. I'm just being facetious. Uh, so this is The Eternal Darkness of the Not-So-Spotless Mind with Matt and Kate. So I, my understanding is Kate and Matt have both been involved in podcasting before, particularly nope. with Duncan. No, yeah. Oh, oh, it, oh yeah, that's right. Yes, guess, yeah. <laughs> Nope. <laughs> I'm pretty sure they have been. No, I was thinking like the you like are was... talking with Scotty and Scott knows shit. I'm the one no, that I, you want to go to. I thought I thought you were like saying like they've been around for a while type deal and like got together and started a new show. Oh no, no, I was just gonna say that they've been involved with Duck Duncan Malik McLeish and yeah. his uh podcast under the stairs. I believe Kate was involved in summer series last year. I'm not sure if Matt was involved in summer series as well, too. Um, because I don't listen to summer series. <laughs> Full disclosure, I haven't listened to the summer series. Um, perhaps I will. Perhaps I'll listen to it this year. It just seems like a really big um, journey. Yeah, it's a and huge undertaking. Gotta, and, it, and it's a big undertaking. And I have a lot of respect for Duncan, who organizes all of it, because I feel like it's a full-time job in its own accord. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, maybe this year I'll check it out. But she and or Kate and Matt have started this podcast where they're going to be pairing movies I think it's a newer movie and an older movie and of course their first episode is just an introductory episode but it was really funny I really enjoyed listening to, them to go back and forth talking about what they've been watching both of them watch a fair amount of movies uh, Matt was on the horror returns recently as well which is a podcast that both Scott and I have been on with yep. uh, Lance Brian and I'm forgetting someone else Lance Phil. Brian Phil, Phil. Um, great show please check it out if you haven't already um, so yeah like I, I really enjoyed their introductory episode I I really ta- liked how they talked about the offspring because you know I guess Matt thought Kate had watched it and kept asking her how it yes. was Kate was like <laughs> was I haven't hilarious. watched it yet it was really funny I like how they asked what they had been drinking and that Matt was having a beer and gin and Kate was having a gin and tonic. Those are definitely my people. Right. Uh, I automatic respect for that level. And I really liked at the end how Kate said something like, you know, I know I didn't say too much to hopefully like sound of my voice. I thought that was really funny and real. So I'm really looking forward to their show. I think that it's, it's going to be a really great addition. I always love when I see male and female hosts, probably because I'm on a male and female host show um probably why i like that so much and i'm uh hoping that we're going to do something together but i see that yes. scott and kate are best friends so i'm going to leave it up to him to organize it um yeah. so if you guys are listening to this and we haven't got back to you yet it's because scott hasn't yep so, you can just yell at me yeah so scott will be taking the lead on that but yeah i really look forward to working with them yeah i i think it'll be a lot of fun and yeah i agree this uh first introductory episode was great because they have great chemistry together like you could tell they've been friends for a while though it sounds like they've not met in person yet which is kind of cool kind of like uh kind of like us like at first we didn't meet in person we just became good friends before we actually got a chance to meet in person yeah but uh, then we recorded after we had met yes so you know we had met and i had you know we were really nice to each other back then i believe they all listened to that episode recently um saying how like this was before we got pornographic and we were we were all like oh we're not gonna swear we're not gonna talk about sex we're gonna have a really clean podcast but you see scott and i you just can't you just can't keep slutty scotty and slutty heather down so (laughs) this is just what you get ladies and gentlemen um, you get all of this you get all of this and they're available on spotify if you're interested in listening to them on spotify and i know they're trying to get onto itunes yep and i believe well. they are also on stitcher and stitcher so both are great areas to find them i listened to them on spotify it was awesome yep. and i recommend uh i'm putting on your socks by the way scotty nice um, because my feet are cold so <laughs> 
<laughs> and but, they're super convenient and close. Uh, but yeah, I recommend checking them out. Yeah, I agree. They like, they like I said, they just were a lot of fun to listen to. <laughs> but yeah, definitely give them a listen. And yeah, what I'm going to bring to the table is our uh, good buddies from the Horror for Dummies podcast. They have uh, recently started, well, they've done a couple of new things, and I wanted to give a couple of them a shout out. So the first thing that they did is they started a Patreon, um, which I believe it was $3 a month. You can sign up and you will get like special episodes of just like Tim's top 10 lists from certain de- uh, certain years of a decade. And uh, also I believe their show, what are you? Doing? It's having on Patreon. Oh. It's Horror for Dummies. Okay. Yeah. Um, but yeah, and uh, also you can get their show Raw, which is them covering a 2021 film in spoilery or spoiler free and spoiler detail. And then they also created a YouTube channel, which I highly recommend everybody check out because uh Tim just recently did a uh, a YouTube video of him showing off how to cook. I think it was like uh, Jack Daniels uh, barbecue wings and how to cook them and make them. And he did this whole like how to process for it, which is great. And then uh, they also have their sideshow, which I think Luffy kind of convinced uh, Mr. Tim Davis to do this with them. And that is Kaboom, where they are talking a lot of like more pop culture style films. So like Star Wars, like I think they're still going through the Star Wars franchise as uh, I think they're rounding it out here shortly. But yeah, it's just uh, pretty much Luffy introducing Tim to a lot of stuff that he hasn't watched before. So in other words, Tim is the dummy on this show where Luffy is the dummy on Horror for Dummies. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, it's fun. I really, um, I really... I really love what they're doing. I think that Tim is one of the most creative people I have ever yes. met. And he puts so much care and work into what he does. And he is just an all around great human being. And Daniel is so funny. He has the best dry um, sense of humor that you will ever see or hear. And the two of them are Aussie. There are Aussie C word that we don't use on this podcast because <laughs> they use it in Australia, but we don't use it. We, we only use it North when, America. We only use it when they're on the show. We only use it when they're on the show. Um, and I really think that it takes a lot of guts to expand like they've had and the work they put into it. And I have yeah. nothing but admiration for them. Um, love them to death. Um, yeah, they're they are some of my favorite people, and I'm hoping one of these days I can actually meet them in person halfway across the world. <laughs> right, right. That's the biggest thing, right? So, yeah. um, yeah, I mean, yeah. I I totally recommend checking them out if you're not on Patreon yet and not a Patreon member of them. I definitely encourage you to support them. They're absolutely awesome. Yep, I completely agree, and I will be sharing the link to their Patreon on our show notes. So. Yeah, if you are fans of theirs um, or you want to give them a listen, first check out Horror for Dummies. And if you like what they are doing, please sign up and be a patron. Absolutely. It's worth it. They're definitely worth it. Yeah, they're worth it. Like the Fifth Harmony song. <laughs> Maybe I'm <laughs> worth it. That, that's Tim. He's worth it. Go He's- Jaws. Jaws forever, Tim. Yes, Jaws is the best movie of all time. And for some reason, you're absolutely obsessed with it. But yes, you're right, Tim. <laughs> for some reason, it's, Jaws is the best movie of all time. It's his gremlins. Oh my god, like like obsessed much. <laughs> <laughs> we love you, Tim. We love you, Tim. <laughs> so we're gonna take a short break and then we're gonna come back and we're gonna talk about our main topics, which is haunted houses. So after these messages, we'll be right back. Cha-cha. Did you ever see a film at such a young age it left you traumatized with cinematic wounds? Oh, necrophilia. Oh, oh, oh. It's a dead issue, man. Don't don't push it. Cinema PsyOps is a weekly podcast documenting an ongoing experiment on the mind of an unwilling test subject. No one should have to watch this movie. Oh, no one should have to watch this. No one should have to watch this movie. Surprisingly, it's not a topic that a lot of people really want to tackle. I'm shocked, crude. I know, really. Right? It's the next sexual frontier that no one wants to explore i am in the most sincerest of senses disappointed in you it takes a powerful goddess like connie jam her arm down the monster's throat and kill it oh, i'm still tripping out over that even as a kid i was like i gotta find a girl like that every week i, I get a new look of disappointment that i never thought i could get it's out of it. unimaginable at 12 years old you should not be watching this movie. obviously at 13 you should not be 14 you should be i'm not entirely sure even 17 year olds should be watching this 
just because you're offended by something doesn't mean that you have the right to demand that it doesn't exist. Watching this film again, I had all of this like little nerd glee with everything Dude, that kept little popping history up. doll yeah, popping up absolutely. at you. So I totally loved this film. Hey, I know why you you know couldn't see that. It's because your brain's warped from watching this shit at 12 years old. Yeah, this is this is a rough movie. I told you ahead of time when we were getting ready to do it that it was. How did you watch movie. this shit at 12? Because physical wounds heal, cinematic ones don't. Listen to Cinema Psyops. Hello, everyone, and we are back. We're now ready for our main topic, which is haunted houses, but not <laughs> paranormal investigators going to haunted houses. So, Scott, have you ever been in a house that you think is haunted? I don't think I have, honestly. Like, no? like a lot of what I've what I've, yeah, a lot of what I've been in, like, has been older houses. So, a lot of just the house. Or who haven't in. you been in? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> giggity, giggity. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Sky. Anyway, older houses that are settling. Yeah, that's pretty much like a lot of the noises that I've ever heard, and like, but I've never, never felt like I've been in a haunted house at all, really. Do you ever feel like you're an old house settling sometimes? My bones, <laughs> my bones make the sound of old house settling. Yes. It's like you ever felt like maybe you're haunted? <laughs> I, oh, I'm definitely haunted. <laughs> oh, man. Anyway, um, so I, I, I think I have definitely been in places that were haunted. I remember I went on this uh, tour back in grade eight, and I went into William Lyon Mackenzie's house, which was a former prime minister of Canada. And I went into the servant girl's room, and they said, this is where the servant girl slept. And I felt this weight on my chest and I couldn't breathe. Oh. And I knew stuff had happened to that girl in that room. And I I had to leave the room. And my good friend Anne had the exact same reaction I did. Oh, wow. Without us speaking to each other. We just both had to get out of that room. And you know, later on we were like, yeah, man, like I felt like a heavy, heavy load had been dropped on my chest and just like a high level of anxiety about oh, wow. that room and i, just I was gonna to turn that into something it. perverted but no yeah well, i guess you could try um <laughs> Hold so on. heavy load dropped on your chest <laughs> you know scott that's not funny for what i was talking about <laughs> gosh you're so insensitive i'm just kidding <laughs> but yeah like it was just really it was hard to breathe and i don't usually have reactions like that and i think i talked about this last year i went on a haunted ghost tour i've been on two different go uh, ghost tour walks and stuff like that and you know i do believe in hauntings i do believe in demons i believe in all that kind of stuff so it's definitely a thing for me um but yeah i bet if, if anyone here is wondering we found a little article on forbes of what to do if you live in a haunted house. So there is actually a step-by-step -step guide to how to handle living in a haunted house and what to do about it. So while going to a haunted house sounds like an exciting night out, living in a haunted house can be far less fun. After all, unlike new hardwood floors or renovated bathrooms, haunted isn't exactly a feature that most real estate brokers will highlight on a listing. And it's fair to say that most buyers would like to know if their home, new home is haunted prior to closing, <laughs> which I find really funny that they wrote yeah. that in there. Cultural observation with ghosts is at an all-time high. From the resurrection of horror movies to zombies to what feels like the entire schedule on the travel channel, <laughs> paranormal has become the new normal. This is exactly why real estate platforms launched paranormal inspection reports for every new home on their website for the month of October. So there's an actual bungalow, bungalow, is that how you say that? Bungalow. Um, um, it's an odd website, but anyway, they now do uh, paranorm paranormal investigation reports. They hire professional paranormal investigators, um, including Becky Vickers, I guess, of Travel Channel's Ghost Hunters to investigate oh, nice. homes in Charlotte, Tampa, and Dallas. But what are you supposed to do if you discover that the home that you're living in is already haunted? Um, so this person spoke with several psychics and experts in the field to identify the signs of a potential haunted house and what to do next. So these are signs that you live in a haunted house. If you think your home is haunted, you probably shouldn't second guess yourself. Whether it's physical or intuitive, you definitely will be able to know, said a psychic that they spoke to. The physical signs include movement of objects, like in the poltergeist. Right. And whispers of airs or um, blurry close bys or in, you know, your peripheral, peripheral vision. Like you see something and you're not sure if it's actually there. Shadows, noises such as knocking or tapping. 
Also, unexplained smells and voices can be an indication. Children laughing, which is fucking creepy. Yeah. Um, but not every ghost will make their presence known in such an obvious way. Um, sometimes there's just a feeling or a change in an emotion. So I kind of talked about that and anxiety that I felt when I walked into that room and the feeling like a heavy load on my chest. That's an example, right? So when you step into a room, strange dreams or feeling something trying to communicate with you psychically can also be a sign. It's also important to observe the behaviors of domestic animals. Pets are pretty good detectors. Watch for strange behaviors in areas of your house or barking at stuff that you can't see. That happens with Mickey once in a while. He'll like stare off and like be staring at something in the corner and just staring yep. and staring. And sometimes I think it's just my grandparents coming by to visit and say hi. Um, yeah, that could be. How yeah. I'm doing, right? So Yeah, like with me, it's like my Dexter doesn't do that, but a lot of my cats will stare at the corner of the wall or stare at something on the ceiling. 90% of the time, I'm just kind of chalking it up to just, oh, there's probably some bug that I didn't catch that they just caught because, you know, cats are hunters. So they so, catch things. You're so that... logic. You're so boring. <laughs> I, I know, I am, right? You really are. <laughs> like, it could be a ghost, and you're like, yeah, well, it's a it's... bug. Well, you know, if, if I pretend it's not a ghost, maybe it'll just not bother me. Uh, you won't be so lucky when I'm the ghost hunt in your house. That's true. <laughs> um, how, like you ignore me, it will just get worse. Um, just, just like real life. Just like real life. Absolutely. No difference in death. How to get rid of a ghost. So getting a spirit to leave a home or property can be far more challenging than identifying one. I can imagine. Yeah. After all, they were there before you. Um, so the first defense is to ask them to leave, but many ghosts just start cooperating. They can become very territorial. And if demanding that they leave doesn't work, this is where I or any respectable experienced medium comes in and we will go in and assess the home and the entity to determine what needs to be done from a simple sage or in incense cleaning, cleansing to a full blown ceremony cleansing. It can be a process. Cleansing and clearing can last anywhere from a few minutes to days. It all depends on how much of an attachment the present has to the home and the people living in it. So Kylie Pushy, who is also a psychic healer and executive coach, shares the key to getting spirits to leave the house is to come from a place of strength. I make sure I feel grounded and strong in myself. Standing in one area or walking the house, I point a finger around the physical spaces I am declaring to clear. I say my name and my right to claim the space is pure in my own. I ask the physical um, infrastructure of the house to hold only loving spirits. Heather Hanna has made a business out of being a real-life ghost hunter. She calls herself Anna Kare. Eminem is the Gaelic word for soul, and Kara is the word for friend. Hmm. Did I say that right? Yeah, Anam? I was. Yeah, Anam Kara. That's yeah. Nam Kara. Yeah, Anam sure. Kara sounds right. Yeah, it's a Celtic tradition, and they're in, Anam Kara is a spiritual guide. So, based in Toronto, woo -woo, hey, of Hannah course, and her business partner Catherine Vaga work on approximately 75 homes a year. We clear homes for real estate agents, people lease their home to renters, people selling their homes, or just purchased a new home and want its energy buffed and polished for when they move in. We also have clients that don't feel comfortable living in their home because they or their children are seeing or hearing things moving around them. The women cleared space using the vibration sound healing technique that they've developed called sound Reiki. I'm familiar with Reiki. My mom's a Reiki master. This is actually a thing. Oh, really? You can believe, yeah, in force fields and energies and have that energy work for you. So I am familiar a little bit with the concept of Reiki. I have never even heard of that. Yeah, it's a thing. Um, we discovered that this technique, we could move energy for healing and clearing the homes and properties with much faster and more effective results. They're also able to practice this technique from a distance. We've been able to see ghosts or spirits on properties and clear these energies anywhere we have the address. That seems a little fishy to me because Ricky, Ricky, you actually have to be close to the energy. So that seems a little odd. But anyway, how to peacefully coexist. So let's say you want to just chill with the ghost. Maybe the ghost starts paying your rent. I don't know. Maybe you sweet. guys like start watching movies together. I don't know. Maybe they kind of like creep other people away that you don't like. So sometimes, despite the best efforts, a ghost will simply refuse to leave. If they keeping the property is an option, the only choice left is to leave peacefully with the with the spirit. So live peacefully with the spirit. Um, so they suggest setting boundaries, which is a good advice when dealing with any kind of roommate or guest. Make sure you stay on your side and they stay on theirs. <laughs> He notes that all spirits, not all spirits are there to haunt. Some just want to keep doing what they were doing before, taking care of people. So one person had an experience where they had a woman who would sleep in their kid's room while they were sleeping. So the dad would pass and would see her in the middle of the night. 
A couple of times I caught her off guard and woke her up. She was going to leave and I told her I didn't mind her being there. I understood she was watching the kids and protecting them and I was happy to have her. One night, the spirit actually saved this individual's son from from real danger. I was sleeping and woke up to her tapping my foot in my bed. She told me to go check on my son. I immediately ran into his room and saw that the sheet was wrapped around his neck and he was almost falling off the bed. I was trying not to panic and felt the woman trying to comfort me. I unwrapped the sheet and positioned him back in bed. I thanked her and told her to make herself at home. Um, when When it isn't paranormal activity. When many of us see or enter a space for the first time, there can be an intangible feeling of positivity or negativity. Negativity. For so, example, entering a, ho- a happy home often feels different than visiting someone who's angry or going through a difficult time. One of our movies yep. really talks about this. Yes. Um, unlike many of her colleagues, psychic Melissa White doesn't believe in haunted houses. Rather, she interprets the source of these experiences as leftover energy as opposed to a ghoul. I think that if something awful and horrific happened in a place, then it can leave energetic imprints in the home or on the property. But most of the time, it's actually built up a negative energy from human stuff that's gone on there. And I would agree with that 100%. You can tell when you walk into a home, if it's a happy home or if it's an angry home, you can Mm -hmm. definitely get those vibes. And one of the movies that we are going to be talking about tonight does reflect that so why don't we now talk about our six movies and we'll start off with the first one all right so the first movie we are going to talk about is the changeling which was released march 28th of 1980 a composer john russell played by george c scott is vacationing with his family when a car accidentally kills his wife and daughter distraught with grief russell leaves his home in new york for a giant secluded house near seattle Soon, Russell starts to feel the presence of a ghost, a boy drowned in the bathtub there. Russell seeks the assistance of Claire Norman, played by Trish Van Devere, who led him to the house initially in uncovering the secrets of the boy's death. Now, this is obviously a classic from the 80s, and it's almost more like a slow burn mystery than I would say horror film, at least for the first. Yeah, it's not really overly scary. Um, It's sad. It's actually really sad um more than anything else yeah i completely agree like this is this is the third time viewing it for me for uh, i watched it for the show and then uh but yeah the first two times i watched it the first time i felt absolutely absolutely bored because it's a very very slow film Mm. um and it just didn't hook me so i just kind of fell asleep in the middle of it the second time i watched it and for some freaking reason i forgot half the story so rewatching it again it almost felt new to me like for the show and man watching it this time giving it the full amount of attention remembering the story this time yeah uh, this is an incredible film isn't george c scott fucking phenomenal in this he is amazing like Like, you just feel and 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 why would this guy give a fuck you know when he walks into this house he just is dealing with the grief of his own loss and somehow he takes it upon himself to basically get vengeance for this child that was murdered yeah like in this house like it is just incredible i find anyway yeah because like it becomes to the point where like you know like the ghost is basically asking for his help through doing the things that it's doing in the house like pounding out like when you hear the pounding throughout the house which you know ties into the boy being drowned and pounding on the tub yeah um but like it's him that child ghost is leading him to certain parts of the house to uncover what happened and i really like that uh russell ends up just like you said taking this really happened in this house and then to find out who the people were that or who the person was that did this and then tying this all into the senator Mm -hmm. and man like it's like i say it's kind of like an unraveling of a mystery the whole entire time but it's just done in such a way that yeah like the haunting because you obviously were talking about this because of the haunted house aspect of it the haunting in this i felt was very realistic and portrayed like a haunted house like yes. really well where it's just strange noises things moving and being put out of place for no reason but like and like just kind of uncovering the secrets of things that might be hidden in this house because this house was wasn't it like a historic house that they were just kind of preserving it was yeah it was a very historical house because this murder was done in the 
because it was done the murder was done very early on like in the early 1900s right like it yeah. was it was a dated murder and it, the house had the beautiful stairway that you would go upstairs to where the boys room so the young boy that lived there previously was named joseph and a lot of his his um stuff was still left behind and you're right at first it starts off with just these subtle noises that are just loud bangings that you don't quite know what they are they're just yeah. bangings yeah you think then, they're coming from the pipes and stuff like that and then you kind of he starts to kind of hear voices and and things start to move on their own accord and then he brings in the medium who has a wonderful role of connecting with joseph and she's writing on the paper what is your name joseph yes how did you die joseph why are you in this house and you can feel the pain coming through and then when they play back the tapes you can hear joseph's voice yeah right and it's very subtle fear that comes through that yeah because that just him replaying that and just hearing the voice in the background that was very just unsettling during that scene and it was a very much realistic haunting, you know, and it kind of shows there's one scene where they show his grief, where he's grieving the loss of his daughter yeah. and his wife, right? He's crying in bed. And you kind of wonder if maybe that's the reason why Joseph reached out to him, that he could understand loss and that he would have empathy to a young boy that passed away. Um, I want to look up something here. And the metal so he eventually gets led to and the investigation that he does through joseph reaching out to him leads him to a property that was once owned by the carmichael family so that was joseph's family was the carmichael's yep. and he digs a hole in the basement because the little girl has been seeing things in her room so the two hauntings are connected and he convinces the mother that they're going to dig open the basement and they find the skeleton of a young boy with his christening medal because he talks about my metal my metal because his metal is missing the other yeah. half of his metal is missing which has been given to this other joseph impersonating the changeling the other kid that was adopted and was raised as the new joseph who becomes a senator right that's yep. how that all kind of ties in together and you can tell that they're trying to like squash this investigation they're not happy that this is happening because really he's un raveling a death that had happened so long ago and a cruel death because we do see i believe it's through a dream that he sees the death he's sleeping and he sees it and joseph is just laying in the bathtub and obviously this child is crippled um he needs to live to his 18th birthday in order to get the inheritance to pass it over to his father for some reason the inheritance is not going to his father it's going to him and if he dies beforehand, then Carmichael, the father, gets nothing at all. It was a very weird legal kind of setup that they had. So his dad drowns him. He pulls him up by his legs. Yeah, that was so cruel to see. And leaves him in this metal. And that's where the banging is. Because Joseph was strong enough to bang on the tub, but was unable to get out. Yeah. Right? Um and I think the highlight of where the haunting gets really intense. So there's the lady that's come to visit him, Claire. And Claire and him are trying to figure this out. So um, John basically gets fired from the university where he's working. He's been teaching music there. They're trying to just get him out of town. Claire gets fired from her stuff, gets told to resign from boards. Like the senator is pulling all the stops to keep this yep, quiet, right? Yeah, because he confronts the senator and like calls out the senator after he finds that medal. And yeah. like the police won't let him get near him and the senator gets really pissed off and hires a cop to come after him and yeah. like does all this shit to try to ruin their lives for trying to reveal this stuff. Well, and they try to intimidate John and John eventually shows up at the senator and tells him the story. And he's like, my father would have never done that. You know, I was like, I, he must have known he was adopted. He doesn't go yeah. into great detail on that, but he must have known that he was adopted. Um but that's when Claire goes to the house while John is out doing this. And the wheelchair chases her. She's chased yes. by Joseph's wheelchair, which I thought was an excellent haunting. That was like the climax of it. Yeah. Yeah. That was like very creepy because that wheelchair also looked just kind of like creepy in itself. Right. And just like, yeah, the way it just was chasing her and it goes down the stairs after her and everything. Like it just was really well done and like a true like style haunting. 
it was really, really cool. I, I find the setup of the old house, the seeing Joseph through dreams, the using the psychic medium and the communication that they do there, the connection of where Joseph's body was and the fact that there was some haunting going on on that other property. I just felt like that came together very nicely in a slow building, creepy type film. And I love how when eventually the senator compares the two metals, his soul comes back to the house where the house is being burnt down and he goes upstairs and he watches the murder happen. Yes. And at the same time in his office, he dies of a heart attack. Yeah. Almost like the full vengeance has come around. And then when at the end, we just see Joseph's burnt wheelchair sitting in the ruins of the mansion and his music box playing because, you know, he finally got the vengeance that he deserved, even though it really wasn't this kid's fault, like the senator's fault. He was adopted from a local a agency or your local orphanage, sent away to Europe for treatment, which he actually went to like a private school. Right. And then came back at 18 and no one would have known any different. Right. Like there was just this belief that Carmichael's father had taken care of him and or taken care of his son, not that he had murdered one kid and replaced him with another. Yeah. You know, and I do have a question, though, like uh, towards the end of the movie with uh, when the climax is happening. Is it me? Like, I took that as uh, Joseph, like, getting angry and frustrated that, like, nothing's been, like, been able, he's not been able to get his vengeance. And is that why, like, the house catches fire and he starts swinging the chandelier to drop down and, like, just, like, gets very destructive with his Yeah, power? I think that's exactly what's happening because he's frustrated, right? This John has been the first to try to alleviate the pain and this is a child right this yeah. is a child that was murdered so he's finally just losing it because he wants that justice and luckily john is able to get out with claire and really i i think once he got the senator and the child that replaced him and the senator knew the truth he got his justice of what he wanted or did yeah. he you know or is he still angry well i guess we'll never know they never made a sequel to this movie and it wasn't really set up to make a sequel but it was extremely well done and it's a canadian film actually it was filmed in canada um, oh okay i was um, i was wondering if it was yeah the budget was 6.6 .6 million and it made 12 million in the box office so it doubled its its budget at the time yeah, that's um, good for 1980. It is, right? And I I really enjoy this as a haunted house film. I think the house is set up to be old and creepy. And, you know, he tries to kind of put the noises down to a house settling. And he's like, okay, banging on the walls is not fucking settling. A kid right. crying is not fucking settling, right? But they they kind of have to go back and forth with that concern of, of what you know, was actually happening in the home and the vengeance piece of it. I love this story. I love George C. Scott in it. I think he's incredible. I would be fine if the story was remade. I would have no problem with it. Yep. You know, if I didn't like it, I can always watch the original. But I just think that it, it really shows a realistic haunting, uh, a realistic haunted house. Yep, I completely agree. Like this one felt like one of the, like, I think there's only two on here that felt like real, like true realistic hauntings. Yeah. Yeah, and this was definitely one of them. And I do like the reasoning behind the haunting. Like, you kind of get it. And I also like the storytelling of how John figures out what's happening. Like, yes. how he begins to put two and two together, and he does his research. And especially when he finds the connection of where Joseph's body is and bringing the skeleton up. And that's when the police detectives get really, obviously, Carmichael, the senator, is really putting the pressure on that he wants this stuffed. Because you got to wonder, he probably had suspicions that yep. something had happened and he didn't want to admit it you know yep. no and one being, would want to think that right yeah but being a senator you always want to put anything that could tarnish your name swept under the rug and absolutely with a death involved by his family saying like you know that he's not the real joseph or whatever it's like yeah i could see why he was trying to cover it up and do what he could to cover it up absolutely yeah so i think it's a very solid ghost movie i think it's a great movie from 1980 and i think it reflects hauntings extremely well oh it absolutely does you know i'm, I'm so glad that you chose this for the show because like i said this watch i actually like remember everything from it after watching it and just yeah i love it awesome Awesome, awesome. Well, our next one, why don't we get started onto that? All right. So our next one is 13 Ghosts, which was released October 26, 2001, which is a remake of William Castle's film from, I believe, 1950-something. Could be wrong, but um, 
Arthur, a financially ravaged widower with two children, inherits his eccentric ghost hunter uncle's glass house. However, the family encounters 12 vengeful entities when they enter the house. (laughs) Yeah, this movie was fun. It was definitely a a 2000s movie, but it was an early 2000s, so it still had a little bit of a 90s uh, uh, thread through it. And Matthew Lillard was great. I I always enjoy when he's in films. He's so good. Yeah, Matthew Lillard is awesome. I've always enjoyed him. I actually remember seeing this in theaters. Oh, nice. Yep, because I was a big fan of the original because my stepdad had me watch it when I was really young. And so uh, when this came out, I was like, oh, I got to see this. So I went to the theater, seen it, had a blast with it. God, I've seen this movie multiple times, probably at least like 15 or so times because I watched it a lot when I was younger. Um, But yeah, this is uh, definitely one of those ghost stories that's like, this is not a realistic style haunted house. it's definitely over the top. Like even the opening scene in the junkyard, I'm like, is this... Is this Nightmare 4? I was just going to say the same thing. What's going on here? But I did enjoy that beginning scene. I thought it was, you know, a good build up to that they're capturing the ghosts. And, you know, Matthew Lillard is psychic and can sense where these ghosts are. And they're capturing these ghosts because these ghosts are possibly going to harm people. So they need to put them away somewhere. Like, I, I got the whole build up to it. And then I thought it was, you know, I thought the whole plot was kind of... Like, is that what happened in the original? Was it like a widower that inherits the house and they have to go there? Because I kind of felt like that was a little silly. No, like, I think there was a, if I'm remembering, I'm probably going to be called out on this, but yeah, I'm trying to remember, but I think it was, I think someone did inherit a house, but it was just haunted. It wasn't just like these ghosts brought there and contained. I think it was just, I think they were just at that house. So they just kind of showed up at the house kind of thing. Yep, and the, I, but, so I think the one part that does tie into it is the original. They w- had to wear glasses to see the ghosts. Okay, so they had to wear these special glasses in order to see the ghosts, like a 3D ride that you're going on. Yeah. Um, I really did enjoy the the house setup. So I think when we get the family there, okay, you've inherited your uncle's house and da 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 da. I I thought it was cool that the house was completely set up in glass and it was very unique. I think anyone walking into that situation would be like oh my god like coolest house to ever but then you find out that it's basically a prison yeah for ghosts and the ghosts were really cool there was a couple of different ones there was like the the princess that had been murdered or something like that the prince um and they all looked creepy they all kind of reminded me of people that would be dressed up in in haunted houses that would be coming after you they had a little boy that had been wronged and and they i get the idea is that they were all evil right that was my yeah and um one thing i wanted i wish i was able to find this to watch because i i used to have the dvd the dvd actually had uh special features on it that should like they gave you backstory on each one of the ghosts and what happened to them that would have been cool yeah so like there's some I, the one with the little kid with the cowboy, I, I, like, I think he ended up getting shot pretending to be cowboy and like someone actually shot him re- in real life. Oh, okay. And, yeah. So it was like, uh, but yeah, like they just like they're, they had these like elaborate stories like built up for these characters that I wish they kind of would have brought into the movie itself, but they really yeah, didn't give that. You don't really get that. You kind of get, just get this asshole lawyer walking through. So he's basically taking the family in and been like, okay, review this paperwork. And then he pieces. Yeah. And puts on the glasses and decides that he's going to walk through and taunt the ghosts, which. Yep, and go get his money. And go get his money. It was obviously just like a plot device to get somebody down there to. Yeah. And then of course they're fucking around with the gears, like the kids and the family. And of course that opens a prison cells yep, and the yeah, ghosts like, start to escape yeah because this had to be done so like this is the part that just drove me nuts was how elaborate this had to be oh, set yeah. up <laughs> yeah. like you know cyrus the uncle is already dead like and yeah. uh well but like so we think <laughs> well well he is dead he's a ghost there yeah yeah but uh no like they, no, you know, he's he, not dead he faked his death well, I thought because he still had like the slit throat and yeah, everything. Yeah, but he pulled left. that off. It, he did, I thought he pulled that off. I like, yeah, I don't think me. he pulled it off. No, I think you're wrong. I'm going to read here. I don't think he was actually dead. All right. Well, either way, the part of what I was getting to, though, is like how he had the lawyer's money. Yeah, Cyrus, it is revealed that Cyrus faked his death oh. to lure Arthur to the house. Oh, well, so son he of a wanted bit. Arthur to be the 13th ghost. Yeah. Or he would have been the 13th ghost. Right. He, okay. Yep. Yep. Never mind. He puffs, Scott. 
I'm anyway. trying. I'm trying. But yeah, like, I, <laughs> like the whole like leaving the bag of money set on the specific trap for this lawyer downstairs. So when yeah. the lawyer lifts it up, that's what activates the house. I'm going all right, this is a bit silly. And then the house just constantly is shifting and moving. Like, I love the look of the house, but it is so ridiculous. Like, I think if I was Arthur, I would have walked in and goes, yeah, I'm selling this. I'm not yeah. living here. I'm selling this. This is going to be right. a lot of money. But like, yeah, it's right. just too elaborate. Like, it, it's kind of corny, but I liked it because of that. But uh, yeah, like this was definitely like the lower tier of true haunted houses. Yeah, this wasn't the best haunted house movie. It was it was fun. Yeah. It was fun watching Matthew Lillard make ridiculous statements and funny jokes. It was fun watching them trying to get away from these ghosts as they kept coming out and switching between who could see them and who could not see them with the glasses. Um, it was great that Arthur's wife came back because she had died in a fire and she came back to save her family. Yeah, well, because to... she got brought to the freaking house. Oh, yes. one of the ghosts. Sorry, she was brought there, which was the whole elaborate plan that she had to be one of the ghosts. So he was just catching all ghosts and bringing them back to this house. And I, I did enjoy the special effects of the ghosts. I did enjoy... Yeah uh the little like we're gonna wander through this house and see what happens but i honestly felt like i was watching people go through an elaborate haunted house yeah and that is like the best way to describe this and i every one of the costumes looked like something you would see at a haunted house like they're cool costumes like cool outfits but they also look kind of plasticky in a way yeah yeah totally like this was a total fun fluffy you know the runtime is what an hour and a half easy going film it's it's not to be taken seriously. No. It's not to be taken as a serious haunting. It has your very typical happy go lucky ending to the to it. Um, Matthew Lillard is a standout. Honestly, Matthew Lillard, yeah. Lillard made this movie, and if he wasn't in it, it probably would have been way less entertaining. But the way he delivered his lines, the way he portrayed himself as being the psychic that could see the ghosts and could communicate with them, um, yeah, it was like it was like a guilty pleasure of what you would get from like going to a shitty haunted house in Niagara Falls. Like it yeah, was exactly it was it was just that it was not you know the best haunting movie. It was over the top, funny, silly. But I would definitely say you know if you wanted to get somebody into maybe haunted house movies and you wanted something fun and fluffy this is an easy movie to sit through and watch i completely agree because yeah like this is just like i said like you said it's fun it's easy um and it might scare some people that are not really into horror films like yeah 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 that's true i think if you're not a big horror film there are some parts that make, make you jump but there were some parts like where she's in the bedroom and then that ghost is just watching her. So the girl, the dog oh, yeah. is in the bedroom and she's brushing her hair. And look, and she's the same chick from Not Another Scary Movie, which is, I always yep. find funny. And right? American Pie. And American Pie. Like, I'm like, ah, it's that girl. Right? Yep, Shannon Elizabeth. <laughs> right? Um, so anyway, it, it's it's fun. It's fun. It's fluffy. But I would not put it as a top haunted house movie at all. No, for sure. No. But like, yeah, I'm, I'm definitely not mad I watched it. It was uh, nice to revisit this, revisit this film after so many years. Now, did you feel bad? bad for any of the ghosts i kind of did i kind of felt like they kind of were pissed off because they got locked in there they were like dude we were just chilling and you came and took us and like yeah i think every one of those ghosts had a right to be even more angry than they already were the one i felt bad for the most was obviously arthur's wife yeah because like she wasn't malevolent or angry like the others what other ones were but it was just her being trapped there to lure arthur in yeah, and and why his nephew? I guess because that was his only living relative that he could manipulate. That was yeah. my understanding, right? Yeah, probably because he knew what happened to his nephew, and his nephew was struggling, so he knew that his nephew would be like, "Oh shit! All right, I'll go to this house. Like I'm inheriting this house from this rich, weird uncle." Okay. <laughs> yeah, right. Not ask many questions, but yeah, it's a fun movie. I recommend people checking it out if you haven't seen it. It's but it, know that it's fluffy and fun, and yeah, you know, it's not reflective of a real haunting. Though the house is really cool. The set must have been extremely like let's. Just to see if they have a budget here for how much it costs to make it because i'm kind of curious uh the budget was 42 million dollars and they made 68.5 million so they did make some money off of this film they made their money back and then some yeah, probably not as is... much as they wanted to but it came out at the right time just before I know, I halloween think, i think this is exactly what they wanted because this this group that made this film are the same ones that uh ghost ship remake the house on haunted hill remake oh, yeah. like all these classic horror films they did these remakes for like that was what they were known for and it, i think that's what they wanted just to bring them back to the light put their own twist on them yeah and make, make a money. little bit of money yep right. 
right? Make them extravagant over the top special effects. Um, And that's fine. You know, just know that walking into this, that it's not going to be anything like probably the original. Right, exactly. And it's nothing like the original at all besides the glasses. (laughs) So let's get to our next movie then. All right. So the next movie we're going to talk about is Sinister, which was released on October 12th of 2012. True crime writer Ellison Oswald, played by Ethan Hawke, is in a slump. He hasn't had a bestseller in more than 10 years and is becoming increasingly desperate for a hit. So when he discovers the existence of a snuff film showing the deaths of families, he vows to solve the mystery. He moves his family, his own family into the victim's house and gets to work, however, when old film footage and other clues hint at the presence of a supernatural force. Ellison learns that living in the house may be fatal. You know, it was interesting about this movie is that I didn't realize they were snuff films <laughs> until you read, like, they are. Yeah, yeah, they're legit <laughs> snuff films. The kids are literally filming, like, them killing their family. Like, I didn't put that together that Sinister was just a collection of snuff videotapes in the... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, that kind of blows my mind a little bit. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> I'm like, oh shit, yeah, it's just a bunch of snuff films all coming together. Yeah, because most of the hor- <laughs> like most of the horrific shit happens when he's watching those tapes. Like, yeah, what's going on around him is not really that scary, but like what he's watching is like the horrific shit. Yeah. Anyway, I I do love the setup of this. I do love when they are live at the home. Uh, I get obviously he's a crime writer and he's traveled around and he's and he's done you know, crime writing in other towns and people don't like him because yep, he obviously he make him the cops look bad making and the cops look bad. And the cop gives him that real like rundown of like, oh, we don't give a fuck if something happens to you. You're on your own. And yeah. the one telltale sign that I thought was a little cheesy is when the wife is like, we didn't move into a house where people were murdered in. And he goes, no. He's yeah. Like, she's like, you know, like the time we moved down the street from a house that people, no, we didn't move down into the house down the street from, you know, there wasn't a house down the street where people were murdered. The murder actually happened at the house, but she doesn't realize that. Which yeah, I think I is such a shitty thing to not tell your family. Like we're yeah, gonna like, move into this home where people were killed, but you know what? You don't need that information. <laughs> right. Well, I think he didn't know that that was where the murders happened. At I think first he until knew. He found, uh, uh, I think he had a pretty good idea. I'll say because I think it was when he <laughs> thought because like at least how I took it, I, I took it as when he watched that one video of the family hanging from the tree, and that's when he realized, oh, this is the house. I don't think he, I think he knew because they would have found the bodies in the tree. So he would have read the report knowing that the bodies were on that tree and he went there and then he was like, oh, but this is actually happening. Great. Now I have something that I can use for my research. And then I loved his, uh, his excuse. Well, technically they didn't die in the house. They died in our backyard. Yeah. Right. Like that is really probably the most completely. Yeah. That conversation though, I will be honest, that argument between Ethan Hawke and his wife is very real. That happens in that bedroom. So once she realizes that all this shit's been, you know, the kids are seeing things, the daughter now has this make-believe friend. Mm -hmm. um, The son has been acting out, which they kind of lead you to believe that the son could be the one, like they set up pretty early that when these, when, you, he watches these films like I don't know how you I knew it was one of the kids that engaged in the murders yeah like I knew that it obviously wasn't the entity doing it or the demon doing it by itself no I he was influencing that, them like I, I I don't know like I felt like that wasn't a shock no, <laughs> no it was not a shock at all like I think it was more a shock as you're watching it, like not because you didn't know, but just more like, oh, I'm watching kids do this. Yeah, right. Because you have the hanging, the drowning, the throat cutting, cutting, and the arson. You know, yeah. so and you, the lawn mowing one, and the Ooh. lawn. Oh yeah, like lawn work. Yeah, yeah lawn yeah, work like, is what it was yeah. called. Yeah. Oh man, right? that one was rough to watch. And even the names of the movies were very like pool time, sleepy yeah. time. Like it was really like it was like written dark. like a kid wrote it too. Yeah, which they did. Yeah, which they did. Right. Yeah. Like, and, like, um. Because I like how they even piece that together, where it's like you know one of the kids always ends up missing from these murders. Like yeah. they never find the body, and you get explained why. Because Bagul, the demon slash ghost or whatever he is, that's Mr. Esteem's Boogie. House. Yeah, Mr. Boogie. He's uh yeah he's kind of influencing because he's I guess he's considered a kid uh, a god, and like yeah. yeah he's influencing these kids because he wants these children, but he has to influence them to kind of do these acts on his own or on their own 
and then he can take them afterwards. Right. And and he has all this creepy stuff, like his son sleepwalks out to the middle of nowhere, and then the dog comes and growls at him, and he has to bring his son back inside, and his you know daughter talking to strange people. And then that one scene where he's basically he goes up to the attic because the video the videos keep moving around. Yeah, right? and playing on their own. And playing on their own. And then he sees all the kids sitting there, and then you see Mr. Boogie come out of the screen and come at him, and he falls down. And what does he do? He breaks his arm or he does something. He seriously hurts yeah, himself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because oh yeah, because it was uh, it was his knee. They like I think they said that like he needs surgery on his knee. Yeah, but like he's like no, 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 I'll stay here. You know, well, he didn't have good health insurance. Just to see, it, so. Yeah, pretty much he's American. Um, so. <laughs> you know, and and I thought so. I thought they did a good job of the house being creepy and the house being where not necessarily these things were happening because they didn't have a pool. Yeah, they were right? happening at different people's houses. Right, and I did like how that eventually kind of connected all the hauntings to being together, and then the common thread that kept everyone from, you know, getting haunting, getting haunted. Um, I, I enjoyed the sheriff that worked with him and kind of went yeah. to explore the Deputy issues of so the house. And so. <laughs> Deputy so and so, I did enjoy the, you know, the kind of the occult thing, the the scene where Anthony Hawkins is walking around the house and he sees all the ghost children. I found that scene yes. cheesy, personally. Yeah. Like, the kids would, like, he would turn around. Like, one got me, the first one, when he turns around, and the girl's there, but he can't see her. Yes. But then the rest of them, I was like... Yeah, like, I think the most effective stuff with the children from those past videotapes was uh, the end scene after his daughter ends up doing what she does. Yes, yes. And you see all the children on the tape, like, just staring at her. Like, yes. they're all in a group just watching her. Like, when they're in the video, I think that's effective because it's like, wait a minute. They shouldn't I be together, agree. but yet they're, they're together. Like, I, agree. I, don't, I don't want the kids haunting the house. I think it's I just agree. more effective when they're in the tape. And um, I agree. So he, so the final thing that happens that gets him to move is the issue with the film projector. So he hears a film projector running and the missing children are seated in the attic. Um, so that's when he leaves. So I guess when that attic thing happens, I guess we're messing this up because he gets upset. He takes the camera and the projector outside and he burns it. Yes. Right. So he's obviously busted his knee beforehand. He's managed to stay there so long and him and his wife have fought about the house and they leave in the middle of the night. Yeah, he just like, like they were this, so we're scared, and they take off in the middle of the fucking night. Which and the sheriff stops them to almost be like, "What are you doing?" And they're like, "We're getting the fuck out of Dodge." And the sheriff, and I felt like the sheriff almost felt empathy. Yeah, like because he even rips up the ticket he was going to give him and just says, "Just make sure you drive the speed limit the rest of the way out of here." Right, and he's, he's just like, like "Go." Yeah, kind of thing. He's like, get the hell out of here. But of course, we know it's not over, right? And yeah. I always thought it was funny that he keeps trying to avoid the messages from deputy so and so. Yeah, <laughs> like I'm done, him. I'm done. <laughs> and meanwhile, he had set up with um, Jonas, who was the kind of the historical expert. That then, when they're moving, they moved back to their old house and talks about the legend of uh, Bugul and what Bugul will do. And then he discovers the unharmed projector in the films in the attic with the label that says extended cut endings. And that's where it reveals that each in each murder, there was a child that was responsible, yeah. which I think most viewers put together before we got to that point. But anyway, yeah. and then he realizes that he's been drugged. Yep. And right? it was uh, like, go to sleep, daddy, or something like or that. Good night, written, daddy. Yeah, good night, daddy. Before losing consciousness. And I always thought it was going to be the son at first. And I'm like, no, mm -hmm. they're making it too hard to be the son. It's totally going to be the daughter. Like, yeah, because totally she's the one that her. was writing the signs on the walls and right? stuff like that. And, right. Like, and like, yeah, I, and you, um, and yeah, like this does not have a happy ending. It doesn't. And I was kind of surprised by that. Yeah. I thought that Anthony Hopkins character was somehow going to get out of the situation he was in. So they're all, so himself, Tracy, his wife and Trevor are bound and gagged on the floor. And she comes in with basically an ax and tells her daddy that she's going to make him famous again and murders the entire family, which is a lot for a child. Yeah, I felt that was like, and I understand that the hangings would have been a lot too. And obviously, Mr. Boogie helped with that and helped like the Mr. Boogie gave her superhuman strength. So she was able to like, because you would have to like, okay, so you would bring the axe down, it would cut into bone. Yep, it would get stuck. You would have to pull it out. And then you would have to have the strength to hit again. Yeah, well, and then also you would have to do that three different times enough to kill them. Yep, and also, yeah, I think Bagul is giving them strength 
like giving him some of his energy or whatever because she also moved all these bodies into the same room together two full-grown dead like yeah not adults. Dead, but like they're adults being dead weight because they're completely yeah. unconscious so she's having to pull them into the rooms like and she's just a small frail little girl so yeah yeah they, she had must... to have some supernatural strength like or them. he's involved or whatever the case may yeah. be so that was the only thing that i kind of felt with off with the haunting yeah to me like how are these kids able to pull all this shit off like it it seems like that piece is just left out we're just left to assume that Yep, that may right. be brought up in the sequel. I don't know. Maybe. I haven't seen the sequel yet. Maybe, right? Um, so yeah, anyway, everyone gets killed, and then she uses their blood to paint pictures on the wall. And, yeah. Right? And so then I dark. agree. The creepiest haunting part is where she's kind of writing on the tape what it was, and then the children all look at her, and then they see Mr. Boogie come behind her, and they run away. He picks her up and goes into the film. Yeah. Yeah, that was extremely just like a haunting ending right. image. And then you just see the the films there and you see house painting as the new one that's been added, waiting for the next family to come to find the films, to move out of that house, to move Have, to a new house, to be yep. killed at the new house so that the constant chain can continue and you can yeah, constantly I, get new children, new families. And I liked that idea where it was, all right, person finds the tapes in one house, moves out of that house, go to this house. That's where they die. Then they, you know, the, those tapes get found again at that house, move to a new house, they die. It's like, so it's like haunting multiple houses in a way. It's a very good haunting concept. I agree yeah. 100%. It's very clever. It's very smart. Um, so I think as a haunted house movie, you know, this was actually pretty good. I think the stuff that happens in it is very creepy. I think this was one of the scarier ones that we watched, um, personally for me, uh, besides some parts that I thought were cheesy. I thought there were some pretty good jump scares in it. Uh, I was surprised by the ending, but the ending made sense for the situation. And I can see why they made, I, was it two sequels or one sequel? Just one sequel, I believe. One sequel. I can see where they made the sequel out of it. I'll definitely check it out because I'm curious to see how they continue the story. Yeah, I'm pretty same. sure it continues with the deputy. Yep. Um, yeah, deputy so-and-so, isn't it, from what I remember? Right. So that would be interesting to see how he does. But I thought this was a fairly decent haunted house movie. It was good. Yeah. It was well done. Yeah, I completely agree. And I and like it just makes it even more unsettling just having these snuff, snuff films hiding in your house. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think the title of Sinister was actually pretty good. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, we can just jump on into the next movie, which in my opinion is uh, right up there with the Changeling as a really good haunted house. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, so this one is The House on Pine Street, which was released on February 28th, 2015. A young woman coping with an unwanted pregnancy, pregnancy moves into a haunted house. Very simple plot, but uh yeah this one was like i never even heard of this one till you chose it and yeah. i'm glad you did because holy crap this one was very 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 effective and literally had me guessing till the very end if what was going on was real or in her head yeah this movie had very realistic hauntings you seeing something that's not there um hearing things uh noises happening that you can't explain yep. doors through. slowly opening doors slowly opening you being in the middle of the room and one door opening on one side and another door opening on another side her being dragged around and the whole time this movie's happening you understand that the main character she jennifer is upset that she's been forced to move back here she doesn't yes. want to be living where they're living. She wants to be back in Chicago. Her and her husband, Luke, have moved back. Meredith, her mother, seems to be very controlling, kind yes. of itchy. And there's just this negativity. Like, the fact that Meredith throws that house party without really clarifying with her daughter whether that's okay or not right. is kind of, you know, shitty. And that's where we have someone who says there's a lot of energy in this house. He's looking up the stairs, which we presume this person is psychic and can see things. So we really get the impression that there is something going on in this house. And with all these other small situations that occur, like the scene where she's in the shower and she feels the hand on her pregnant belly and she thinks it's her husband. And yeah. she keeps saying, no, no, I don't feel like it. I don't feel like it. No, no. And then she leaves the shower and then she realizes that her husband was in the other room. Yeah, that was really creepy. Really, really creepy. Like very subtle hauntings take place in this. Very subtle hauntings. Yep. Like the only time it doesn't get really subtle is when she's getting like slammed against the wall and thrown yes. down the stairs. Like when it gets, yes. when, the, when the entity gets angry. 
But the one thing I liked about this film is that it does make you wonder if this is in her head or not. Because they talk about how, like, in the beginning, like, she doesn't want it, want this kid. Mm-hmm. She does not. She's not happy that she's pregnant. Mm-hmm. Like, she's basically grudgingly staying pregnant for her husband and not getting rid of the child. Mm-hmm. And like, she like because I well, and she like, tried to con- she yes. tried to perform a miscarriage, uh, um, an abortion on herself. Yes, I was right? going to bring that up. Yeah, and, like, yeah. And like, so they're thinking that she's using these excuses of these hauntings as like reasons to move out of the house, yep. get, get rid of the child, all this yep. stuff. Like she, like they and they just don't believe her. And yeah, the way the film plays it out, it makes you wonder the whole entire time. Like, absolutely. Is, is this in her head? Is she doing this to herself or is this yep. real until like literally the very end scene? And- yeah, no, you're hundred percent right. And even the very end scene. So, you know, I think Scott and I will sum up what we're talking about. So all these subtle haunts and th- creepy things happen. She has this next door neighbor who's ultra weird. She eventually finds out that her next door neighbor's kids don't talk because of select mutism. Yep. So she's wondering if the girls had seen something and not talking. That's what I thought that was supposed to be connected yeah. to. Or if it was just so it was supposed to be a psychological example of people choosing not to engage in anything. That's, yeah, that's a good way of looking at it, yeah. Right, because it really goes back and forth between is this her you know, dealing with the fact that she didn't want to have this baby in the first place and now um, it's she is having the baby and she does go through and she does have the baby. She is admitted to the hospital. She does have the baby. She's kind of kept under watch, almost like a, a, some concerns of um, what is it they call it when they're post after you have a baby postpartum, oh, postpartum depression. Yeah, yeah, postpartum depression, depression, right? Yeah. And she seems to do pretty good. She goes back to apologize to the psychic that she had yelled at before when she had had the psychic in her home and they had had that confrontation. And she's like, I thought you were coming here to help me. And she stood up and there was a big shadow behind her. Yeah. Right. Which you're kind of wondering, was that just the evilness from her? And and the psychic, back to the article we talked about earlier, talks about energy. Yeah, like he says, he doesn't see anything. He just feels the energy there. Exactly. And And that maybe it's the energy of the house. She never wanted to be there in the first place. And maybe now that she's leaving or that, why why don't you just leave? You never wanted to be here. You're angry and you're making that house angry through it. It's feeding off of you. Yeah, and I thought that was a very realistic portrayal of a haunting. Because, yeah, like it, because it doesn't say there was like any spirits there or anything like that. But no, it was just like, the her pent up anger creating this negative energy that is causing all of this stuff to happen right and i thought that that was really interesting and then of course her husband dies at the end he hears something in like that crawl space area and then opens it up and nothing's there and we don't really see what happens to him we see the doors open and stuff and then we see him on the front lawn yeah like thrown through the window so the question is did he kill himself and jump out through the window or was he thrown through the window? Now, most people don't commit suicide through jumping out a window. That would be horribly fucking painful. Yeah. And so it, it leads us to believe, like, what about the entity, right? It's interesting. Yeah, that that's a very good question. Because I, I didn't even think of it as, like, maybe he committed suicide. Like, I just assumed, like, this was, like, the final thing to go, see, this really did And that happen. probably makes more sense, right? Um, like that makes a lot more sense that this was the thing that finally kind of proves that the house was not what it seemed, or maybe it absorbed so much of her negative energy that that's how it released it was killing him. Yeah. Yeah. Cause it sounded like the, like after this, like they were going to be moving back, I think. Yeah. Yeah. So, it sounded yeah, so- like she was going to get what she wanted. Um, yeah. So it was almost like the negative energy, like, well, I got one last chance, expel that energy. Yeah. Maybe. Maybe, right? Like it's um it's really interesting. Yeah, like this one had me glued to the screen the entire time, just trying to piece it all together because it was just so well done. And the thing is that the hauntings were subtle. They weren't yeah. over the top, you know, crazy hauntings. They were very much like doors closing, you know, an image in the background that you didn't quite see, but maybe you did see. Um and I really thought that was smart. Yeah. I thought that was really smart that they did it in such a subtle way that they didn't need to spend a lot of money in the budget in order to do it properly. Right. They were able to create that, is this the stress of the baby and the unhappiness of being there, which is yet again, mental health stuff done well. Yes. Yeah, this was done correctly. Like, 
like without just like being like insulting. And it also talked about the stresses of her becoming a mother and wanting to be happy, but also being terrified. And like her mom says that speech of like, I didn't really want to have you, but I went and had you anyway. Like what a fucking horrible right. thing to say. Why would you tell your daughter that? Right. So the negativity in that household, I, I really feel like this was a great rubbing to um what happened like a good tie in sorry to the psychic saying about energy i really yes. felt like this movie tied into that the best yeah yeah this one portrays like literally the negative energies in a household that you can feel when you walk in yeah i really i really enjoyed this film for that and i think it did very well with the budget that it had and- Actually, and this just brought, like made me think of it too. Um, when the neighbor lady comes over, like the look that she gives her, like and refuses to come in the house, like it makes me wonder if, like, when she came to the door to like offer the cookies, and uh, you know, of course there was that awkward exchange between the two of them. Yeah, she was like, "Oh, I'm sorry. Would you like to come in?" And the woman just looked, "No." Like, it makes me wonder if she felt the energy from the doorway and was just like, I'm good. I'm yeah. not going to come in. Yeah, I wonder if that's true. It's a really it's a really interesting story. And I would say if people want to watch something that is a little bit of a slower burn, a little bit of a more realistic haunting, like the Changeling, but not the over-the-top effects that yeah. we saw in the Changeling, I think you would enjoy this film. Um, yeah. You know, as an example of how you can do a haunting really well with low budget without making things cheesy. Yep, exactly. Like this was really well done. Yeah, it's an independent film. And I think for an independent film, it really did well. And yeah. in the same year, we had this released with your girlfriend, who, <laughs> you know what, who does a pretty fucking awesome job in this yes. film. Like, I, I honestly think this actress got better with her acting as she got older. Yes, she Personally, has. I just I think completely she's way agree. better now than she was when she was younger. Yep, and the movie we are talking about is the one that I brought to the table, and that is We Are Still Here, which was released June 5th, 2015. Every 30 years, a lonely old house in the fields of New England wakes up and demands a sacrifice. Now, the reason I brought this one up was because I felt this was a totally different take on a haunted house. Yeah, because unlike like in not like you know almost almost every haunted house movie, when you feel the presence of a ghost, you're cold. You feel yep. cold. Yep. In this, it's heat because mm-hmm. of the way they died, and also because of the pure animalistic anger of these ghosts. And the special effects in this, oh my god! Yeah, that makeup for the ghosts. Yeah, with a touch of CGI Fuck. showing the crackling, like burningness to them, and the white Fuck eyes. It's good. Yeah, these ghosts are horrifying. Yeah, like, like it's scary. This was a scary movie. Yeah, like this one is it's scary and probably one of the most violent ghost movies I've ever seen. Yes, I yeah, Barbara Crampton's in this, by the way, of who we're speaking about. Um, yes, when we talked about a, an actress, and she nails the role as a grieving mother. Her husband Paul had moved to this new home because their son had died in a car accident two months earlier. Their son's name is Bobby. And they invite some friends out to stay with them. And prior to their friends coming, they they start to have these really weird things happen in the house. Pictures knock over. She hears things in the basement. They bring in an electrician um, who's going to fix the furnace, I think. No, I think he was kind of like checking the thermostat because they were going to have someone else oh, okay. come over to fix the fir- thermos. Or okay. Furnace, not thermos. But, yeah, I know, uh, yeah, I know what you were saying. Um, but, uh, but so he was just checking like stuff downstairs. He was just a repairman, a random. Yeah, he was kind of like okay. the maintenance guy there. Um, okay. that Like the local guy that you would call to just come and fix your thermostat and stuff like that, I guess. Is that what he yeah, was presented I, as? Okay. That's kind of how I took it because like after he said, all right, there's, there's this type of issues with the house. The father ends up or the husband ends up like calling up the company that was supposed to fix it and just goes off on him because they well they go off on him also because the guy is comatose so he finds him in the basement because the ghosts have come after him and he's fucking comatose yeah like and that's and they kind of start showing the ghosts really early on in full like image yeah they they do not shy away from hiding them yeah and yeah that's another thing too also a kind of a reverse of regular ghosts where when they touch you it's cold No, when these guys touch you, your flesh is burning. Like they are giving you burns, like because they're just on fire. And I look, that is one thing I loved about this was just the way these ghosts work. Cause yeah, like you were saying, like it's a grieving mother and her, or yeah, grieving mother and her husband. They move to this house just to get away from the old house full of the memories. Mm -hmm. And she feels that the, the stuff that's going on around the house when it's just them is their son, Bobby. 
Yeah. She feels that he followed him there, which by the end, she might not be wrong. But yeah. um, but then yeah, she calls her friend who's kind of like a psychic or like person that kind of like can speak to spirits and her pot- pothead hippie boyfriend that goes along with her. Oh, they're which... they're they're married. Their husband and oh, wife. Oh yeah, yeah. husband. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, the, uh, and that's played by Larry Pesden, which is, he does an amazing job as well. Oh, he does an awesome job, especially when he gets possessed. Oh my God. He is frightening when he's possessed. Right. And and that's the thing. This house, the movie of the haunting of the house was so well done. These ghosts are angry. You see little hints of them at first, um, you know, little things happening at first. They keep waking up at three in the morning. Like there's this kind of shit that's going on. And then, or they don't wake up in the third. I think they wake up a couple times in the middle of the night and they hear shit. But it's it's leading up to that big scene with the seance. And then when Larry gets, or I guess it's Dave, Dave gets possessed with the demon, the head demon, the head of the household that was murdered. You realize how angry these ghosts are because they killed David and Kat. So the couple that came to visit, their son was supposed to be coming out there with his girlfriend. They show up while that couple's in town having, the two other couples are in town having dinner. And the ghosts fucking murder murder them murder yes. them murder the guy the son in the house and then murder the daughter while she's driving while she's driving away like, these ghosts are beyond vicious and they're not confined to the to the house and we find no. that out because this is why the people in the town need these people to stay in the house because they need them to be a sacrifice because yeah. this house wakes up every 30 years and takes a sacrifice yeah and it keeps and if it takes the sacrifice because what they what they the townsfolk uh through conversation you hear them talk about is that if it doesn't have a sacrifice it goes through and starts fucking with everybody else in the town and killing people yeah and so they need the sacrifice to surely. satiate it and yeah like um and it makes me wonder what i'm trying to remember the name of the family that died there it's the dog mare Dag- Dagmar. 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 yeah the Dagmar. Dagmar. Yeah, when the Dagmars like are there, it makes me wonder like, is there two different types of hauntings in this house? The ancient evil that is the 30 year slumber and the Dagmars are just like, since they were like the first ones to die there, they are the ones that are stuck there trying to perform these kills now. Or is it like, uh, or is that is the Dagmars the ones that wake up every 30 years? I felt like the Dagmars were the ones that wake up every 30 years because I think yeah, they don't really explain that piece. You're right. That's not really explained at all. <laughs> yeah, because I, I felt like the house itself was like just that spot was like a very powerful energy there. Yeah. And the Dagmars were just unfortunately the first sacrifice. Yeah, I think you're right. I think your and your um your perception of it is correct. Yeah, and like and because yeah, like after this we find out like that these townsfolk like want these want the family to like to be the sacrifice so they'll do anything they can to like force them to do it and the dagmars seem to be like obviously yes they possess dave and kill him but at the same time that almost like they're trying to like because they could have killed the rest of the family easily but they didn't and i think it's because bobby is there i think it's because they know that family has experienced grief which i didn't fully get because then they take the son away from the other family causing them to be in grief but maybe they felt like this family that had moved in was more respectful. I don't know. Yeah. I like don't I know think, what that situation was. Yeah. That part left me a little confused on for sure what was going on there. I'm thinking it's mainly because I'm thinking it's because Bobby's spirit was there and like convincing the Dagmars to leave his family alone. Maybe that's why the other part of the family, like the hippies and their son got killed is because Bobby was only trying to save his family. Yeah. But that was kid was his best friend. Yeah, I know that's that's right. the part where that's part of leaves me questioning. And this may just be something that is plot holes. We may be trying yeah. to just these are plot holes. So really, you know, you kind of just watch it, enjoying the special effects of the ghosts, um, and f- enjoying how they fuck up all the townspeople that yeah, enter when, the house later. Oh man, when right. they show up, it's like a raid on the house, and these ghosts just fuck these people up. Right. And maybe so that bad. was the sacrifice they needed. They got all the sacrifices that they needed and they took the people that they felt were the most sacrificed. And and maybe Bobby had something to do with them staying in line. Maybe he didn't. Maybe they just got what they needed and they understood the grief of them with losing their child. And maybe they just saw them as good people. And that's why. But this is an excellent haunting story. And even the credits are creepy when they yeah. show the house being built and that it was at one time 
him um, a funeral home. And then it, yeah, it, it was a really well done ghost story. I strongly recommend watching this for the special effects, the creepy hauntings of the house, the awesome kills that are in it. Yeah, awesome, awesome, awesome. Yeah, this is one of the be- one of the better ones I've seen in several years, and it's not slow. It is like that. It it's just goes. very quick. It is very quick. So we'll move to our final haunted house movie, which is not very quick. Which is not very <laughs> quick. Not at all. All right. So this one is "I Am the Pretty Thing That Lives in the House," released on October twenty eighth, twenty sixteen. Hired to care for a, a reclusive elderly author, Paul, who played by Paul Prentice, a live-in nurse played by Ruth Wilson, comes to believe her house is haunted. The director of this was Oz Perkins. Um, I'm not sure how I feel about this movie. Yeah, it's it's a very slow burn haunted house. Now, if we look at just the haunting, let's not look at the other shit. Yeah. Let's just look at the haunting. I think the haunting is subtle and done well. Yes. You know, I think that we we are introduced to this house. There's a lady who is dying. She was a horror writer. She's living in this home. This nurse comes who seems rather um, socially awkward, very reclusive. And we have some subtle, you know, hauntings that happen to the nurse. So we have the phone that it, for Lily, which is pulled out of her hand that she's talking to. It's a wired phone, one of those yep. cord ones. And it gets violently pulled out of her hand. She talks about how skittish she is and scared she is of things. Um, she hears things happening in the house. There's the mold that grows. Um, the author refers to her as Polly, who is a character from her novel, instead of Lily, asking her where she's been. Um, There's just a a constant feeling of uneasiness. What I didn't get about the film was that she she was in the... (laughs) Sorry. (laughs) That she was in the house for about a year. Like, I, when, so the nurse is there for almost a year experiencing this stuff. Yeah. You caught that, right? And I felt like that was a really slow ghost taking a year to kind of reveal herself yeah like and i gotta be honest with this movie i this was uh i watched this on monday we were recording on saturday i had to read the wikipedia today because i could not remember a damn thing that happened in this movie like the only thing i remembered was the phone getting yanked out of her hand well the phone she sees the figure walking around the spot of black mold which grows bigger and bigger which you eventually find out is based off of a story that the author wrote about Mm -hmm. the lady in the wall which is where polly the character is murdered by her husband on their wedding night which she later finds out is based on a true story of what happened in the house the husband had built the house for his wife For some reason, let her walk around it blindfolded. She took off her blindfold at one point and he kills her. Yeah. And no one knows why. I assume because he suspects that she was unfaithful. Like that is my only thought. That's kind of what I'm thinking. But you never get any kind of thought of that as she's wearing her wedding dress and her husband's like super old. And then her body is left in the walls. So she's reading. So our main character, Lily, is reading this story about Polly, which has actually happened. And I guess there's this growing dread that is happening for Lily because we've already know that Lily's super afraid of things. You know, previously she said, I'll probably die of a heart attack. I startle so easily. And eventually Lily tries to bring up the book to Iris and Iris gets very angry and explains that Polly betrayed and abandoned her and reminds her that even the prettiest of things eventually rot. So then Polly's ghost visits Iris and whispers in her ear, investigating a mysterious sound. Lily finds the wall boards removed and a pile beside the moldy wall. And then she's started by Polly's ghost. Yep. In which she has a heart attack. And then she now haunts the house. Yeah. Like, I I felt this one was just very, very confusing with the way the haunting was. Because, like, at first I was like, okay, is this woman buried in the house or is this like a entity that took over a character that was named polly from this author's story like i just felt yeah, very confused I, I, by what was going on i really i think it is clear that polly existed she was murdered by her husband she got put in the hole the, the in the wall that's why the mold kept coming up yes um iris wrote the story about it but polly is obviously not at rest and keeps coming back and going out and coming back and coming out and is a frustrated ghost 
Lily becomes a new ghost, but her intention, because she was a caregiver as a nurse, is to care for the people in the house. Because we see the young yes. boy brushing his teeth, and she's like, I am the pretty thing that stays in the house. And I got the feeling that she's like, I'm here to watch over people. Yep. I figured she's, right? she's not frustrated or no. angry. She's just, because she was like, already kind of an eccentric character. In well, the, and she was a caregiver, with. right? Where, where yeah. she was killed by startling and having a heart attack. She kind of always knew that she would die young. It seemed like she realized and that she felt that her goal was to be a caregiver. So she was yeah. now in, embodying the house as a positive spirit. I think Polly was a little bit of an angry spirit because she was murdered and kept in the house. And when Iris said what she said, it enraged Polly and forced her to come back. Yeah. Because right? even the prettiest things rot. So I, I think it's just a very subtle haunting of the house and the house being used as a novel. And maybe that told Polly's story and that made her happy, but then she got angry. And, you know, that's it's it's just a long drawn out movie for something that could have been probably a short <laughs> Yeah, so that's, 20 minute film like probably is what the issue is right yeah because that was the issue is like i think for me is watching it i just had a hard time keeping my focus because it was just so dragging everything out that i forget what i forgot what happened because it just took so long getting to the point so when yeah. i read the wikipedia i'm going all right yep a lot of this is coming back now yeah but like yeah i i felt confused while watching it reading the wikipedia helped me obviously like focusing on it understand i'm like okay yeah. But man, yeah, this one was not the most enjoyable for me out of all these films that we watched for this topic for, for me personally. Yeah, I think it reflected a subtle haunting very well. Yeah. I think it reflected, you know, a ghost wanting its vengeance through having the stories told through the author, creating that story, talking about it as the lady in the wall and it being a, a realistic thing that had happened and this author befriending this ghost. Um, this ghost probably becoming jealous or maybe upset that Lily was there and maybe choosing to leave because of that. Maybe that's why she pulled the phone out of Lily's hand and right. then knowing that Lily was easily started startled came to fruition to startle her and now lily stays there and lily is is more of a kind entity so i think it just kind of looks at if we go back to our article the difference that different entities can take some are going to be yeah. kind some are going to not be kind and they're going to haunt the house <laughs> that you live in right and i think you make a good point like i think the plot is is you know clear but i think because it's, it's pulled out over an hour and 28 minutes where it could have been 25 minutes um you know it, it makes it but they're trying to do that to build the character you're, yeah. you're, you're trying to understand lily's situation and and what she's like and i would say the acting is awesome oh um, yeah the direction is great oz perkins is a great director i just think the story is dragged out a bit but we got to remember oz perkins is working with a screenplay and writing like it's not him writing this and then right exactly doing it, right i think when it came to directing and having people react certain ways or, or how things were set up it was great yeah I, I will say that too, yeah. Right. So a decent haunting story for, you know, reflecting positive and negative entities, but definitely a slow burn that may not be for everybody. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah, completely agree on that. So for our Out of the Dark segment, we wanted to talk about scary movies or scary story. It could be a ghost story or it doesn't necessarily have to be a ghost story, but something that we want to see made into a film. Um, what would you like to see made into a film, Scott? All right. So, uh, yeah, when you brought this up to me, I instantly, first thing that popped in my head is Joe Hill's first ever book. And Joe Hill is Stephen King's son, but his first novel, The Heart Shaped Box, which is about a guy named Jude's Coin that is a metal musician and is obsessed with collecting bizarre and creepy things and objects. And he ends up stumbling upon an uh, auction for this thing that a ghost, uh, a, for a thing that's haunted by a ghost, which ends up being this old dirty suit. And he uh, takes the deal and orders it, gets it to his house, and then the hauntings start occurring, like, after the suit is brought into his home. And, like, it has a very, very angry, vengeful spirit attached to this suit. And it just the story itself is very creepy, very just like it's like a different style of ghost haunting. It's not haunting a house, it's haunting an object, an mm -hmm. object that cannot be destroyed. Mm -hmm. And it's mm -hmm. very just like the way it plays out is it's super creepy. And I find this could be a very unique, cool take on a 
uh, on a story for a ghost. Like and what that. would you and what would you want to see, like particularly of it coming out and being in film? Like what would really stand out to you for it? Uh, what do you mean exactly? Well, how would you want it filmed? Like, okay, I'll, I'll tell you. Joyland is mine for Stephen King. Okay, so have you ever read the story Joyland, Joyland at all? No. Um, so Joyland is basically about an amusement park. And there, there's a murder that happened there years ago. And the person was never found responsible for it. So as this person's working at the amusement park, it happened in like the haunted house thing. And you go through there and you hear voices and you hear things and, and things start to happen. And there's an ending scene where there's a standoff between the actual killer and, and the, our protagonist. And they're on one of those octopus rides. And they're actually fighting on the ride. And Stephen King describes how the arm is moving up and down. And I think how that scene would be incredible to have it filmed. So I would want it filmed in a sense of like focusing on the park mostly because there's a lot of other side stories that are in the book. I would want it to focus on the murder happening in the park. And then I would want it to focus on this young man coming to work at the park. And then the subtle things that happen at the park that lead to it. Because there's a side story relationship in it that is fine. Like you could include it a little bit, but it's not the major part of the story. Like, because when you transfer a book to a movie, you have to cut out something. Yes. Right. So what would you want the main focus okay. to be? That, right. That, okay. That, that, okay. Now I, I knew if I explained mean. it, you knew what I was talking about with my example. Yeah. And like Stephen King and Joe Hill are both great examples of that because they but go they're on related. <laughs> Yeah, and right? they go on tangents like that. Yeah. They give so much detail. Right. Uh, so yeah, with with this story, I would want it to focus mainly on obviously the main character getting the suit itself mm. and the because uh, there's a lot of like side story stuff with different characters that come in and out of it. Sure, you can bring them into the movie, but you know don't focus on their life because you don't really need to know much about them. Yeah. But yeah, like yeah. of course, like so much detail they give you everything about every character in these books. And so, yeah, I just want, like, the characters to come kind of come in and out, give a little bit with them. But like, So you wanted to focus more on the suit with the characters kind of there, but not to the tangents. Like, for in Joyland 2013, it goes over, it's a young man that goes to work at this amusement park, right? And it talks about it, he's saving money and stuff like that. And there's this whole, like, side story of what's going on. You know, he goes down to the beach with this with these with this girl all the time and hangs out with her there. And she's part of it at the end too, but not the major part. The major part is the mystery behind the amusement park and the creepy stuff that happens within the amusement park and what eventually leads to this. And to me, it's the standoff where they're on this basically this octopus thing going up and down where he's confronting the killer while the ghost is still present. Right. right? And I would love to see, and I, I remember when I read it, I could just envision the arms of like this octopus ride you know what an octopus ride is where they yep. have the separate cubbies okay and going up and down and trying to keep your balance and fight back for your life on that, this yeah, ride that would be cool i just see. think the sound of it would be awesome you know to have that kind of thing come to life in film yeah and yeah and, that, and for me like i yeah i wanted to focus on the backstory of the serial killer that is the ghost now haunting this suit because mm. it was a suit that this killer was in i believe and like I want to find I want them to focus on the history of that, like as he's like, as the main character is haunted and he's investigating it and finding out like a lot of the backstory that way. And it's with him and his girlfriend. And I want him to you know, I want them to obviously be the main focus because they are the main characters. Yeah. And then focus on like the backstory of this killer that is the ghost. When and was the uh, novel written? Uh, the novel was written, let's see, trying to find information. Oh, I'll go to Wikipedia here. Uh, 2007. That's interesting because this Stephen King's book was written in 2013. Yeah, so they're like right next to each other. Like they're It's right kind of funny that we other. both picked like family. <laughs> well, and I always really enjoyed this novel. And I don't read a lot of fiction. I don't have the time for it, just with other stuff that I do. And I remember reading this and thinking, man, this would be a great movie to make, like a good movie, a good story to make into a movie. Because a yeah. lot of Stephen King stuff gets adapted. And I'm sure eventually um, Joe Hill will have the same thing too, right? Like, yeah, well, every one of his books have been adapted except for this one, which I'm actually reading right now. The film rights to Heart Shaped Box were acquired by Warner Brothers in 2007 to be produced by Akiva Goldsman, Irish director Neil Jordan wrote the script and was slated to direct. The project stalled in development hell. Oh, so, yeah, it sounds like that's something that happens quite frequently to stuff, unfortunately. Yeah, but like his uh, other story, Horns, I uh, had uh, that one got turned into a movie and had Daniel Radcliffe in it. Oh, that was Daniel Radcliffe. Oh, yep. nice. I didn't know that that's where that movie came from. And that's then, cool. Then Shudder has the TV rights to Nosferatu NOS 4-2. 
Wow. Cool. Yep. And so that, that one, I think, has got two seasons. So two out of his four books have been turned into film or TV. And I think he's done, yeah, uh, Fireman is the other one. And then The Heart Shaped Box, which apparently was being made into a movie. Which, yeah, I would love to see that actually. Hopefully it gets out of development hell. And if Neil Jordan is still going to work on it, hell yes, because Neil Jordan's a great director. That's awesome. Yeah, you brought a really cool one to the table, Scott. It'd be exciting to see some of these made into films, right? Even though they're yeah. books and some people don't like that because you can never have the full novel experience. But like, but there you're are never going to have the full novel experience. Right. And <laughs> if you're, and if like, and sometimes people just run out of ideas and the best way to get a new idea, read a book. There's millions of books that have some amazing ideas that could be turned into a series. Or well, it's a movie. like the Reading Rainbow right now. Do you yeah, ever exactly. see the Reading Rainbow? Reading Rainbow. <laughs> Scott's like book. the new, <laughs> Scott's the new guy from Reading Rainbow. Take just a look. read a book, everyone. Stop watching horror movies. <laughs> Take a look. It's in a book. Smoke shows rainbow. <laughs> <laughs> well, you would have a rainbow too. That's really sweet. That is. Right? Well, <laughs> I guess that concludes our episode of um, our episode 31 haunted houses haunted houses <laughs> um we actually covered a fair amount of different types of movies today and talked about two books that we would like to see made um into actual motion pictures that involve ghost hunting um mine's a little more of a murder mystery i think yours sounds like it's more ghosty yeah. uh, but i just think both of them sound like they'd be really cool to have made and i like the way how we want them focused on like i yeah you know, what we want left out and what we want left in. It's going to be the most important thing, right? Because you can't include everything. Yeah, you know, I wish you time. could in some things, but yeah, not enough time in the world. You know, like only Lord of the Rings can do that. Exactly. Well, and then they cut out a whole bunch of shit. People yeah. liking Lord of the Rings are like, no, they didn't, Heather. There was stuff cut out of Lord of the Rings. It should have been 18 hours long each movie. I mean, it should have been, but you know, you know, I'll take what I get. <laughs> You're a Lord of the Rings fan? Oh, hell yeah, I am. You didn't, you, you know that. Oh, of course you are. Lord of the Rings was, don't get me wrong, great, great pictures, but I have no need to rewatch them. They're, I have zero need to rewatch them. Well, they're movies that I'll rewatch not often because of how long they are. But like once, like every couple of years, I'll just be in this mood where I'm like, fuck yeah, I'm going to watch the, the original like, trilogy. I feel like watching three movies to throw a ring into a fire. Yes. I am going to totally watch Lord of the Rings. I, I'm, to be honest though, I'm mainly in it for the massive scale battles they have. Mm. Those are the best part of the movies. Yeah, like they are just fucking amazing. You are absolutely are not wrong there. Yeah. <laughs> but um, in the meantime, thank you so much for joining Scotty and I in our haunted house adventure. We'll be back next time. I don't think we have a guest yet. I think nope, we have I a guest think... not scheduled till June, right? No, nope, we have one at the end of May. End of May. So we will have a guest at the end of May, and then we'll have another one after that. So this will be a year of guest spots. And I don't know. We have a topic list, but we never really worry about to talk about what we're going to talk about next. We just kind of just leave it. Yeah, we'll just we'll decide while I'm in the middle editing this one yeah that's probably what we'll do that's how we always roll yeah so i think we only have one plan and that's like in the beginning of may with the whole uh prom night thing that is i think you're right i think that's the only one that we do have planned so we plan on releasing the video for this uh in case you want to listen on youtube and stare at scott and i i don't know why you would but if you want to you can because <laughs> um, we're sexy yeah absolutely that de definitely scott is you can definitely check out uh, you are too in his glory um but anyway until next time what do you have to say to the people scotty unpleasant dreams <laughs> Thank you.